Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us today for the 26th meeting of the Climate Action Council. My name is Maureen Letty. I'm the director of the Office of Climate Change at DEC, and I'm standing in for Sarah Osgood, who was unable to be with us today. Uh, today, the in-person CAC members will be participating in the meeting in either this room here in Albany or in New York City. And this is uh, to help the public able to view the meeting in these locations. We are broadcasting over webinar. Uh, as approved by the CAC at their last meeting, there is an option for virtual participation for members with extraordinary circumstances who could not join in person at either location. So now I'm going to hand it over to Jenny Cox from Cadmus to walk us through procedures for today's meeting before we dive into the agenda. Jenny? Thank you, Maureen. Um, so that we have another smooth and productive meeting, I'll just remind you all um, in our two locations of our logistics and procedures for today. Uh, we will ask that the location remain on mute if no one is speaking so we can limit background noise. Um, we'll also monitor both locations to ensure that they are muted. Um, if a council member would like to speak, they can raise their hand or stand their placard on the end and the co-chairs will make note of it. Um, and the co-chairs will call on members in order, starting in one room, then move to the other room, and call on members in the order that they raise their hands. Also, for the benefit of the public observing the webinar, um, we ask that you please state your name before speaking throughout the meeting. Um, and this applies to all speakers at today's meeting. And to improve audio quality, we ask that speakers, especially in the Albany location, try to project their voice towards the ceiling uh, mounted microphones. And as a reminder, members participating remotely uh, must be on video and their first and last name must appear on their video conferencing screen. And I will hand it over to Co-Chair Segos. Excellent. Thank you. Are we off mute? Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. Um, let's do a roll call if we can today. Uh, if we could have folks around the room identify themselves. Basil Sagos, DC Commissioner, uh, CAC Co-Chair. Good afternoon. Maureen Harris, uh, NYSERDA nice President and Co-Chair of the CAC. Uh, Rory Cooper, <coughs> uh, CEO of uh, DPS, Chair of the PSC. Brian Steinmuller, New York State Department of Agriculture and Markets, filling in for Commissioner Ball. Ann Reynolds, uh, the Alliance for Clean Energy New York. Gavin Donahue, Independent Power Producers of New York. Marie Therese Dominguez, New York State DOT. Dennis Elson, Met Phillips Lido. Donna DeCarroll, National Fuel. Henry Spleetwell for Commissioner Bass at UH. Great. And in uh, New York City, if you could go off mute and identify yourselves. Tom Falcone, LIPA. Justin Driscoll, Interim President and CEO, NIPA. Roberta Reardon, Commissioner of Labor. Paul Shepps of Stony Brook University. Samantha Pierce, Vice President of Sustainability, filling in for Commissioner Visnaskis at HCR. Peter Iwanowitz. Mario Salento, New York State AFL-CIO. Ian Wells in for Hope Knight, uh, Empire State Development. Great, and I think we've got Keisha on as well. Yes, Keisha Santiago Martinez. I'm representing Secretary of State for the Department of State. He may be on his way. I know he was trying to make it. Thank you. Okay, any other CAC members on uh, Zoom? Uh, yeah, Bob Howarth here. Uh, sorry, I can't be with you in person due to uh, unusual circumstances, but I'm, I'm here via Zoom. Okay. With that, I think we have a quorum. Um, thank you all. Uh, now we work over to the agenda. If you could pull up that slide. Okay. Uh, welcome to roll call. Complete. Uh, Co-chair remarks and reflections is Dorian and I often do. We'll take a couple of minutes to go through some recent updates with our, our work, and we'll get into the integration analysis and the important work that's going on uh, in that regard. And then very specific uh, feedback and discussion by topic. You'll see the list there, adaptation, resilience, gas system transition, buildings, industry, health, and transportation. Um, and then we'll go through, of course, next steps as we look ahead to a busy fall and early winter. Um, 
Do you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, I, I do want to note, I, I believe Raya Salter, member, has, oh, has joined. Raya, are, are you on? And Rose. Um, Rose Harvey, have you joined virtually? Okay, I think I saw them join, but we'll, uh, we'll double back. Sorry to interrupt you. Great. No, not at all. Okay, um, so Dorena, I'll go through just a couple of quick updates from uh, the last time we met. Um, why don't I start with Doreen? Great. Um, so it uh, has been yet another uh, busy month, uh, certainly lots of developments uh, along the way. In fact, just yesterday the governor announced uh, $18 million is available through a nat natural carbon solutions innovation challenge. I think this is a very interesting topic for this um, council and specifically NYSERDA is investing in innovative nature-based solutions that lower emissions and sequester carbon through novel products and services. And uh, certainly with a strong emphasis on benefiting underserved communities and environmental justice areas as well. So that's an interesting RFP just issued yesterday. We also um, announced through the governor an $8.5 million climate tech growth platform um, that was issued just last week, which is supporting companies commercializing technologies that reduce greenhouse gas emissions across New York State. So this is really about entrepreneurs who are scaling the technologies we're talking about here in this room, and we're excited to allow them to not only exceed uh, the stage where they are, but also to scale up their products and services through this opportunity. Um, over to you, Basil. Well, DC announced a $1.35 million award, a uh, new partnership program with land trusts to help preserve New York's forested lands, which of course, as we all know, having been through this discussion for the last two years, uh, there are enormous benefits uh, that come with preserving forest and land, including biodiversity, ecosystem benefits, uh, stormwater mitigation, and of course, climate resiliency. Yep, and then um, specific to New York City, but relevant certainly, as you'll be hearing about with our buildings team today, um, there was an important milestone in the city's implementation of Local Law 97 in which the Department of Buildings released proposed rules for establishing the procedures for reporting on compliance with the GHG emissions reductions that are part of that critical New York City buildings law. Um, I will note those rules are open for public comment until November 14th. Um, certainly another exciting announcement is the public-private partnership with Micron Technology, um, which many of us participated in um, this month. Uh, as to the excitement that it's building in uh, investing in a cutting edge semiconductor manufacturing campus in Onondaga County. I say this as not only one of the largest economic development projects in U.S. history with 50,000 jobs statewide, but also consistent with New York's um, nation leading Green Chips Act. It's going to draw its electricity from 100% renewable sources and really make far-reaching sustainability commitments at the same time. I say this specifically with the CEO of Micron noting that New York was a target for the company in part due to the climate law and to our commitment to environmental and sustainability principles. So certainly an exciting um, milestone there with further announcements from IBM um, thereafter as well. In addition, in the building sector, uh, the governor has announced six new real estate partnerships um, as part of our $50 million Empire Building Challenge, which is really focusing on tall, large buildings, uh, specifically within um, our cities across our state. And these partners are going to be deploying technologies to build on the projects we've already invested in that are specific not only to these types of buildings of, of tall uh, multifamily and commercial buildings, but also looking at some of the engineering and technical solutions that are necessary to address them in an integrated manner. And uh, last but certainly not least, and another exciting economic development announcement was that Electrovia is a producer of lithium ion batteries for transportation and utility storage, has selected the town of Ellicott in Chautauqua County as the location for its first US plant. And certainly, um, it supports the broader New Energy New York initiative, really creating a national hub for battery innovation and manufacturing here in New York State. So uh, an exciting uh, month and certainly many, many areas to reflect on there. 
Um, I'll pause now to see if any additional council members have joined. I know we were expecting um, Rose Harvey and or Raya Salter to join. Uh, Rose Harvey just joined us. It didn't sound like Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Rose Harvey is here. Does that sound like Rose? There we go. That is Rose. <laughs> So I just want to, um, and, and Raya, have you been able to join? <laughs> okay, just for virtual attendees, I just want to remind you, you do need to be on camera with your name displayed um, according to our, our rules for remote participation. So if you could please do that, that'd be great. And um, that is the latest from us. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next, I'll turn to Carl Moss from NYSERDA, who has joined us to provide some updates related to our further development of our integration analysis and its modeling. So, great. Carl. Thank you, very much. Great to see everyone virtually and in person. Again, I'm Carl Moss. I direct energy and environmental analysis at NYSERDA. Um, and I've been helping to lead on the integration analysis uh, for the council. Um, so just a brief preamble, um, towards the end of last year, we did some, some work looking at the trade-offs between different ways of, of decarbonizing heat within New York and looked at a, a case study around higher adoption of ground source heat pumps and, uh, and uh, district loop fields. And what we found last year was that in trading off the extra cost of those systems and the expansion of um, and, and, and an ability to better manage our peak and our grid, um, we found that that system was a net higher cost system, that the extra cost of these more, more advanced heat pumps would actually um, be a, a net cost. But we recognized there were a lot of uncertainties in that work. Um, so we committed to coming back to the council to further explore some of those uncertainties. Um, so that'll be my, my focus talk. I just have a few slides today. Um, we will be following up on some of the IRA analysis and we'll be posting some, some more details on the website in, in the coming weeks. Um, we're also thinking through if there's any additional analysis that can bring insights in, in the coming meetings. Um, but today is going to focus on building heat and our peak analysis. Um, so um, the, the objective today was to explore implications of an unmanaged low growth. So what we looked at um, last time were our core scenarios, which have a very managed growth. So deep energy efficiency, active <coughs> load, um, and looking at how our, our heat pumps can perform well over time. Um, what we want to explore is some of the uncertainty in some of those variables, what we're calling an unmanaged load growth, um, and see what the implications would be for ground source and district heat pump adoption um, and some of that, that net cost analysis. So what do we mean by the managed growth versus unmanaged? Managed building application would have some significant levels of energy efficiency coupled with the expected air source heat pump performance during the coldest times. Um, and that aligns with our, our, our scenario two analysis. When we talk about unmanaged, we look at less energy efficiency, um, lower degrees of smart devices and kind of active load, um, as well as pressure testing some of the assumptions around how air source heat pumps might, might perform on peak. And we have some of the key parameters up on the slide. Um, so for the managed uh, work across all of our core scenarios, um, we had a peak heat pump performance of around 1.6. This is lower than the average over the year because they perform less well during the coldest days. Um, but there are operational characteristics of how heat pumps are actually utilized that could lower it further. So while we believe 1.6 is a reasonable assumption for systems right now, we wanted to pressure test what if that was a lower performance on peak. Um, what we did last year, we're going to do again today, um, which was we looked at a, a, a shared district heat uh, grounds for assumption in our core cases of around a quarter of heat systems. We asked the what if those systems were to grow to over 50%, and in this case, 65% of our stock. Um, so a significant growth in ground source and district heat. What would be the overall impact on the system? What would be our net cost analysis? Um, and then we, again, wanted to pressure test some of these key variables between managed versus unmanaged. Um, so we asked the question, in an unmanaged world, if we see significantly less deep shell retrofits, what does that mean in terms of peak? And therefore, the benefits of ground source heat pumps to help manage that peak. And then what if we saw significantly lower smart devices and animated load? Um, our research has shown that 15% is um, not an aggressive, but an actual reasonable expectation for how smart devices could lower overall load shape. But we say, what if that doesn't materialize? What if we only realize half of that? 
So again, pressure testing a number of these key variables to understand what happens to peak and then what would be the, the commensurate uh, benefits of a district system and, and more ground sourcing pumps. So that's a bit of an overview of the assumptions. Uh, next slide. So what are the impacts on peak? I, I want to take us kind of step through what the outputs show. So the, the uh, uh, bottom two lines in blue are our core scenarios. Um, so you'll see today we're around 30 gigawatts of peak. We think with the managed growth um, and, and, and decarbonization, that could grow um, up to uh, 40 gigawatts, and we would transition to a, 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 a winter peaking system. Um, what we found last year, and we reaffirmed this year, if we were to shift to ground source and more district heating, we could lower that peak by around 4 gigawatts. So a meaningful drop, but not a significant one. So what we're really looking at here is what happens if we see unmanaged growth, and that's what these red lines show. Um, so if we see unmanaged load growth, we could see peak growing on to the order of 58 gigawatts, so nearly doubling of our peak. Um, and in that scenario, we see that a significant uptake of ground source, which is much more efficient during those peak cold times, was significantly lower. Um, and so we could see a drop of around 12 gigawatts of our peak um, when we would see these district heating systems. So clearly a significant impact if we don't uh, realize the high levels of energy efficiency and um, peak load management. So that's the story of what happens if we have unmanaged load in terms of a, a much larger peak and what would be the impact of switching to ground source and district heating in those two worldviews. Next slide. So first I want to walk through what would be the, the economic impacts of an unmanaged system. So this focus here in, in the graph, the, the bar on the left is the managed electrification system, which we've shown before. Um, a net cost of around $80 billion for the transition. In an unmanaged system, we see that growing by on the order of uh, $30 billion, $27 billion, if we see an unmanaged system. So what does that mean? Why are we spending more? We're seeing on the order of 14 gigawatts of additional need for firm capacity. Um, so that's you know more potential hydrogen systems as well as you know our short duration battery storage. We also see incrementally more renewables on the order of four gigawatts. So a substantially larger system to meet that higher peak. Um, in our core assumption set, we see that that split of that 27 billion is predominantly at the bulk system level on around uh, 20 billion and 7 billion at, 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 the, uh, at our, our distribution system. We've also been asked, okay, we, we know that our, our, our distribution system costs are built on the best data we have, but they're uncertain. We've done a deep dive into some uh, uh, different studies that have been looking at distribution system costs and what if we see the kind of growth that we, that we might expect through this decarbonization. Um, and there was one study in, in particular that we found to be useful. It actually is part of our transportation analysis that we did this year, looking at deep levels of EV penetration where there was some novel distribution system analysis. And what we found in the highest case within that study that there could be a doubling of the cost of the distribution system, so that that marginal cost of adding more distribution system could be twice as large as what our core scenarios analyzed. So we wanted to layer in that sensitivity in, 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 into this work. Um, and so that's what that error bar shows, is that if our distribution system costs were twice as high, that would be the, the net impact on the costs of, of our decarbonization in these two worldviews. And just to kind of boil it down, so the higher distribution system costs would further raise the relative cost of unmanaged case by 14 billion. So it takes that roughly 30 billion, that 27 billion, up to around 40 billion. So that's just the cost of looking at managed versus unmanaged. Um, and so as part of the analysis, we want to say how much of that could we offset by looking at ground source and district heating. So next slide. So what we see from a higher adoption of the ground source heat pumps and district heating could reduce system costs between 15 and, and, and 23 billion. Um, so again, that's if efficiency and air source heat pump performance lags. We could see a, a net reduction because of the ground source heat pumps between 15 and 23 billion. So that reduction of, again, around 14 gigawatts of peak has a lot of value, uh, tens of billions of dollars worth of value. Um, and so this, you know, what physically would happen in the system, it would mean that by deploying more efficient heating that reduces our peak, we could reduce the need for firm capacity and energy storage by 13 gigawatts and reduce the amount of renewables that, that, that need to be built. Um, so that's the benefit of looking at 
higher adoption of ground source heat pumps in district E in an unmanaged system. So that's the one side of the, of the coin. It's a 15 to $23 billion benefit. But what's the added cost? Next slide, please. So when we look at the added costs of adding those ground source heat pumps, you know, they are more expensive systems, building out infrastructure to have shared loops, building out wells to do ground source. In this scenario framework, it's on the order of, of $19 billion of cost. So what we see is that from this analysis, previously there was a significantly higher net cost from ground source. In this work, we now see it being net balanced. So on balance, we see that the savings that can accrue to, to, to ground source heat pumps are on the same order as the net costs. So we're not saying that there's a clear winner here of ground source heat pumps, but what we're saying is that there's a significant opportunity here. Um, and that you know, with higher adoptions of, of ground source heat pumps, we, we see that there, that there could be an advantage to managing an uncertain peak. And we really, what we need to do is ongoing work to monitor and evaluate these, these relative costs over time. So it calls for in the scoping plan to have an adaptive policy process where we can look at going after some of these more efficient heating systems that can better reduce peak. And as we see the evolution of the grid and what the cost of those are, we can over time decide what the best trade-offs are going to be. And clearly, substantial growth in ground source heat pump and district heating is something we're already exploring. Um, and, and we think there was going to need to be novel financing and new, new coordination opportunities in order to build out these types of, of new heating systems. So next slide, just the key takeaways. Um, so just to recap, I think this analysis has affirmed to us the, the, the uh, value of energy efficiency, the tune of billions of dollars, just in, their, in, in the reduction of the peak. And it's critical to achieving our CLCPA, both in terms of the economics of the system, as well as the, uh, the feasibility of being able to avoid having to build out significant infrastructure. We see that ground source heat pumps and district heat pumps have the potential, and they're, they're a potentially important measure for limiting peak growth. Um, and the, the development risk that would come with having to build additional gigawatts of clean firm resources and the other distribution and transmission infrastructure that would come from it. Um, and therefore, we're recommending that there be continued effort to monitor and evaluate the relative trajectories and costs of ground source heat pumps and district heating compared to the, how the electric system actually evolves over time. So that's, that's a deep dive in a focused area, basically in response to the follow-up of what we brought you last year. Um, so with that, take questions. Yeah. So uh, this is Rory, uh, Rory Christian. So I'd love it if you could go back mm -hmm. to one of the earlier slides where you talked about the adoption assumption, adoption rate. Yeah, and I just right. want to clarify something if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Yeah, if we can go back, I think it's slide six. Sounds right, yeah. One, a couple more. More. There we go. Thank you. Oh, too much. <laughs> there we go. So I just want to. Yeah. Pull one, one. one more, please. Slide Four. six would be great. Thank you. So I want to make sure I'm, I'm reading this the right way. So we're talking about deep shell retrofits that are then accompanied by smart devices in addition to the deep shell retrofit. Correct. Correct. Okay. So I, I think you've been too conservative. Um, in my experience, if someone's going to go to the effort of doing a deep shell retrofit, the smart devices are going to be there by default. Uh, the, just the marginal difference in cost is so minor compared to the deep shell retrofit. Right. Yeah, let me clarify. So those that 26% that is, is the impact on the percent of stock. That smart devices is, is the impact on the overall load shape. So those two uh, aren't linked. Uh, what we're saying is both of them happen in the scenario, but they're not coincident. Other. So there would be actually significantly higher levels of smart device than on the, than the 26 percent of buildings. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No. no I think, good, 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 yeah, good clarifying question. Yeah. No. And, and you know, your last slide, the, I wrote that down as you were talking because I wanted to mention that earlier. I, I think you hit the nail on the head in highlighting the significance and the importance of energy efficiency the whole way through. If we can be much more efficient in how our buildings are built and operate, then the need to build out bigger systems, bigger 2D systems is diminished significantly. Um, and that, you're, you're, I really appreciate you putting this together. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you may want to state your name for the Yes, you just have to remember my question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ann Reynolds is my name. I know that much. Um, one question is, is there a significant difference in the price of the district heating systems in an urbanized area versus a suburban and like what is it much more cost effective some places than other that one was one question the second one 
putting aside the other implications, political or cost, whatnot, could we achieve the deep shell um, retrofits and the smart devices through building code if the building code was incredibly strict? Or is it more of a behavioral question that would be optional? Yeah, so on the first one, yes, there definitely are different economics depending on what the kind of what the land area is that, that's available. If it's a suburban or an urban environment in terms of building out district loop fields, you need to have critical mass of dense population to do district heating. Um, but certainly kind of individual ground source heat pumps, it uh, certainly varies in cost if you have land available. Um, so we what we looked at for the integration analysis at, at a statewide analysis are averages across those. Um, but certainly there needs to be kind of a specific utility by utility analysis for their service territories where they see the opportunities. Um, and then we can uh, target those. I think our, our, our finding in that regard is, you know, what we want to do is encourage that, that, that uh, further analysis. At the end of last year, I think we kind of ended on a note that said, we're not sure that there is a lot of bang for the buck here. And what we're seeing is given those benefits and the uncertainty on how peak could grow, um, that if we could see a significant cost declines, great. We're fairly conservative of kind of what the costs are here. And even with those conservative forecasts, we see that there's kind of a meaningful trade-off um, between an uncertain peak growth and how to manage that peak through having more efficient cool uh, heating and, and, and cooling at, at the building site. Um, I'm sorry, and your, your second question was... Could, could you get out things through building code? Like if, if a building code in a few years was developed in a certain way, mm -hmm. would you have more certainty about those numbers? Um, certainly, building code could drive deep energy retrofits. Um, you know, what we analyze here are kind of looking at, 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 at the cadence of when buildings are touched. It's not necessarily the case that every time a, 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 a building gets a retrofit that it triggers code. Um, so I think there would be a percent of this that uh, building code could, could drive. But getting to the order of a 26%, uh, so a quarter of all of our buildings have a deep shell would go, I think, beyond just the natural turnover of new construction. Thank you. Uh, Dennis, you had your card? Yeah, thanks, Carl. I believe it's great analysis. Can I, again, uh, we use the term smart devices, just mm -hmm. you know, it has a lot of meanings to someone like me, by the way. So uh, I'd like to get a little bit a better understanding of what you mean by smart devices. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, is that when we talk about battery storage, are you talking about battery storage at the grid level or at the distribution level? And, uh, and then really thinking about this from the point of view of how do we shape load profiles, especially if we're talking on the distribution side? So was that, I mean, because I always hear that we're gonna shift from summer to winter and I, and I really, think that that's short-sighted and it's not as creative as how do I shift hour to hour? That makes sense, Carl? Uh, because if I move battery storage in a systematic and holistic fashion closer to the point of use, to me that's smart devices. And to Ann's point about building codes, building codes really are very restrictive on things like battery storage. So part of our assessment or recommendations need to be, we need to get a little bit more aggressive on building codes to accommodate this type of technology if in fact it's a direction we take. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, those are good, good thoughts and good recommendations. Um, just to address some, some, some of the questions there. So smart devices in this case, kind of some of the case in points are the kind of the traditional now thermostat type of programs where we can shift Know, pre cool um, and, and be able to even incrementally change what are the heating and cooling loads. I think another classic smart device is the water heaters that we have throughout our system that are not smart right now. So we have thermal storage capabilities within all of our buildings right now through our 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 uh, our water heating systems. If we can leverage that that thermal storage to be able to shift when that heating happens, we can shift when our uh, our, our peak occurs. The way we treat storage is more as, as an active device, and so we do do a combination of distributed and, and, and large-scale storage, and we explicitly model that as its own lever within the system versus a basket of goods, which are the smart devices that make animated load at, at a building. So we, we do look at the kind of full range of energy storage, and when we say storage in this context, it's usually meaning uh, short duration, so two, six-hour, eight-hour batteries. 
long duration is a, is a separate category, which can have everything from hydrogen, which is on-site fuel, to some of the more advanced batteries. And it's at the point of use, right, and, and right. facility itself. And, and would you include in your definition of smart devices AMI? Sure, being able to leverage the capabilities of AMI. Right. Like AMI, AMI is an enabler to allow for the transparency of data in a building to allow smart devices to, to, to operate. So I think it's an enabling technology. Great, thank you, Carl. Yeah. I know we have a number of questions in New York City. Um, so perhaps we can take those and then the virtual attendees. Great. And just for everyone's awareness, New York City Secretary Rodriguez is here. Any questions, New York City? Yes, I hope you can hear me well. Is Peter Iwanowitz here? Hey, Carl, um, maybe we can advance the slides a couple, maybe the second to last one in your stack there. Um, I believe it was the ground source district um, heating, uh, that one right there. Um, Great. Yep. Do you have a percentage of the cost impact here that's attributed to labor? Um, I would argue that it's not a cost as much as a benefit to New Yorkers to have good paying jobs in this little space. And just was wondering, you know, if there's a percentage breakdown of these cost increases that are related to, you know, employment of people doing these projects. Yeah, I don't have that off the top of my head here, but we can certainly follow up on what the capital O and M and then what's the labor component of, of the assumption of that that nineteen billion. Sure. Right. I hope we kind of list that as a benefit personally, but Carol, great Thank up second here. Hmm? But, um, just curious on the subject of cost. If you do, or how you do, take into account the changes in the equipment costs as the market grows? Yeah, so we do have forecasts of, of technology advancement for, for all of our systems. So everything from solar and wind to heat pumps. Um, and so those have been documented on, online as part of our publication of our draft scoping plan. So we, we'd be happy to point you to some of those cost decline forecasts. Um, and then we did a further sensitivity at the end of last year to say, what if we see more aggressive cost declines? Because we've historically seen, when you look into the uh, literature, we, we tr uh, traditionally see that our core forecasts underestimate what the potential is from learning by, by, by doing. Solar is the classic example. No one forecasted the 90% the, uh, the cost decline that we've seen in solar. Um, so we did look at some alternative forecasts and also um, look at those um, more accelerated cost declines and show what the impact would be on the net benefits. So does that get that incorporated into the air some. bars? And I assume the air bars are not symmetrical. Correct, so, yeah. So yeah, and, and we do have those in our in our um, draft scoping plan. So ha happy to share those with you. There is an asymmetrical air bar. We've looked at uncertainty in both fuel prices as well as technology costs. Now, in this slide, we focused on this new uncertainty, which was our distribution system cost expansion, which is something new that we've been able to bring forward from some research this year. But we can share both of those with you. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm understanding there are a few hands raised, um, starting with uh, Bob Howard. Yeah, th thank you, Dorian, and, and thank you, Carl. Uh, great, great presentation. I'm really uh, pleased to see you uh, having explored the district heating and the ground source heat pumps uh, further over the last year. Uh, the question it follows up a little bit on, on Dennis's question on storage and, and your answer to it. Uh, in, in terms of storage, uh, you mentioned thermal storage, but in terms of water heating, Presumably, we can also encourage thermal storage for the space heating. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that would be an easy technology to combine with the district heating or with ground source heat pumps, uh, less so for air source heat pumps. And, and just, I, I would imagine that thermal storage on the time scale that you're talking about six, eight, maybe 10 hours or something to uh, even out electrical load demands would be more cost effective than uh, electrical storage. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if that's included in your analysis or if you think that's a logical thing to look at further. 
Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It um, should be further explored. What we've included in our, in our smart devices could be called the kind of the passive thermal inertia of a building. So where you can shift. I mean, every building is has thermal storage um, and just native to, to the building. And that's part of what some of those uh, smart controls can take care of by looking at smart thermostats. Then adding further thermal storage is something we, we have explored, but um, and, and it's included in the work. But we, I, I, I agree that I think it's an area that's ripe for uh, further analysis and, and and innovation to think about, you know, how we can compare both electrical storage and thermal storage as as, as options in the future. And, and just a, a follow up on that, it's, uh, am I wrong in thinking that might be a, a better technology fit with the ground source heat pumps than with air source heat pumps? And if so, maybe it's worth keeping track moving forward. So again, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Um, I believe we've covered all the questions, both virtually New York and Albany. So, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. So if we turn to the next slide, um, next we're going to be continuing our discussion uh, commenced the last meeting of feedback by topic area and by chapter. So uh, we are going to start uh, where we left off last time with adaptation and resilience, then gas system transition, buildings, industry, and public health. In addition to reviewing the public feedback, any unresolved climate justice working group feedback previously provided but not fully integrated into the draft scoping plan will also be presented for the council members to consider. And we will have a follow-up item from the previous discussion on transportation as well. So during the presentations we're about to hear, staff will capture feedback and reactions from the council and, of course, use this information to craft proposed revisions to the draft scoping plan text for further consideration by the council. So um, if we turn to the next slide, I will hand it over to Mark Lowry, Assistant Director of DEC's Office of Climate Change to cover adaptation and resilience. Mark? Here I am. Thank you, President there Harris. You are. Good afternoon. Um, just as a reminder, even though the statute does not require that the draft scoping plan include um, adaptation and resilience recommendations, the council co chairs asked the land use and local government advisory panel to produce such recommendations in addition to that panel's recommendations that address greenhouse gas mitigation. So the adaptation and resilience recommendations are included as a, as a separate chapter from the local government uh, uh, and, uh, and land use or land use local government advisory panels, uh, other recommendations. We received only about 20 unique comments on the adaptation and resilience recommendations during the public comment period, and all were generally supportive of actions to adapt to climate change and to enhance resilience of residents, infrastructure, and communities to climatic hazards. In many cases, the comment simply repeated or reinforced recommendations that were already included in the draft scoping plan. In fact, we received no comments objecting to any of the adaptation recommendations. And most comments called on the state to provide more leadership and resources in aggressively implementing the recommendations that were already in the draft, particularly in the form of assistance to municipalities. One commenter urged the council to support enactment of the Emergency Responder Act, which would provide liability protection to licensed design professionals who render advice uh, and assistance during times of emergency, including extreme weather events. There was a preference among commenters for use of natural resilience measures, particularly in disadvantaged communities. Um, and uh, which brings me to what I think was the most important uh, recurrent theme of the comments that we should not only prioritize disadvantaged communities in our adaptation resilience programs, but seek to use those programs to address past and current inequities and that equity and just transition principles should figure prominently in all of our adaptation resilience planning, including in the selection of a chief state resilience officer. Next slide, please. Several commenters emphasized the need to develop or amend design guidelines and regulations to ensure resilience of built infrastructure and natural systems under future conditions and urged the state to develop the means to value ecosystem services in its decision making. 
A few commenters stressed the need to incorporate climate education in kindergarten to 12 school curricula and for public outreach campaigns to encourage the necessary behavioral changes to achieve the CLCPA requirements. And a few others called on DEC and other agencies to make climate change information more actionable and available. Um, and um, some urged the council to support enactment of a stronger flood risk disclosure law. Next slide, please. The Climate Justice Working Group provided feedback on the preliminary recommendations at the September 13th, 2021 Council meeting, and staff did attempt to address that feedback in the draft scoping plan. And we will recommend additional language for the final scope or for the final plan to more clearly incorporate that feedback where necessary. Two points of Climate Justice Working Group feedback remain outstanding, however. In response to the Climate Justice Working Group's point regarding positioning of an adaptation and resilience subcabinet, staff recommend that the Chief State Resilience Officer, once appointed, report directly to the Director of State Operations and chair the adaptation and resilience subcabinet, which would comprise the heads of the relevant agencies and authorities or their designees. And with the Council's approval, the staff would add that detail to its recommendation regarding the CSRO, the Chief State Resilience Officer, and the subcabinet. Regarding the Climate Justice Working Group's point that the Department of State required boat and vehicle emissions reductions through the state's coastal management properties or policies, the Department of State advises that these policies focus on land use and development and would not be effective in the absence of emission restrictions put in place by other more relevant um, regulatory agencies. Next slide, please. In planning revisions to the draft scoping plan staff for the final plan, staff recommend that language committing the state to incorporation of equity considerations be strengthened throughout the recommendations. Staff will, with the council's approval, develop recommendations to address several specific comments received from the Climate Justice Working Group and during the public comment period, including programs to more active, proactively address inequities, to support development of resilience zones or hubs, provision of multi-language guidance materials that relate to adaptation and resilience, and to develop guidance on evacuation planning and incorporation of new power technologies into local um, adaptation and resilience planning with a prioritization of investment in frontline communities as an overarching theme. Staff do not recommend that the council necessarily take the position on enactment of that emergency responder act that I mentioned, but again, we would take council direction on that. Next, please. Also, with Council's approval, staff will include recommendations regarding standards for manufactured and mobile homes, as was suggested, a requirement that all state-funded comprehensive plans uh, include consideration of forest and farmland protection, more flexible permitting for adaptation projects, and development of guidance on valuing ecosystems with a preference for use of natural resilience measures as another overarching principle. Staff recommend adding language to current language to emphasize the importance of school-based education and public outreach. And finally, staff do recommend including a recommendation uh, in this final scoping plan in support of enactment of a stronger flood risk disclosure law. But again, we would take council direction on that. With that, I am happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you, Mark. Um, Anyone here in Albany? And did you have a question? Uh, Hi, this is Rory. Um, curious about the uh, what work has been done with mobile homes, and I'm wondering to what extent you can speak about that. Um, I happen to know that that particular uh, housing stock tends to be uh, particularly aged and uh, usually inefficient from an energy perspective. So curious to understand. Uh, the degree of work that went into uh, thinking on that topic. Well, Frank, um, we have now had the opportunity to explore that as much as I think we should. So I think the recommendation will be for the state to actually take up studying that issue, both of the efficiency and the resilience of those of mobile homes and modular homes. 
Got it. Thank you, Mark. And I'll, I'll add, you know, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development um, does pay a great deal of attention to mobile home stock and have interest in their improvement as well. So there may be opportunities for the state to collaborate through HUD in whatever we move forward with. You know, I'll just make an observation about, about mobile homes. Um, just in my experience at DEC, usually it's the mobile home parks that are hit the hardest during storms, whether it's rising water levels in Lake Ontario, inundation of all the homes there, or it's the valleys that have, you know, substandard appreciation for streambacks. And um, that's just something to think about, not just the homes themselves, but the placement of them, and any role, state or local role in, in zoning those. I understand. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, Mark, thank you. Uh, I, this may not be the right place, but I, I want your opinion on, you know, most of the DAC communities that I'm familiar with are, are rust belt oriented communities uh, that, that really lack infrastructure or lack electric capacity in which to actually revitalize. And part of the objectives of the CLCPA is to create jobs. Uh, and so what happens is, is that utilities then tend to place the burden of infrastructure upgrade on developers, which minimizes the attractiveness of these type of communities at a time when it, they should be the most attractive. Uh, have you explored that correlation at all, Mark? No, we have not. That, that was not raised during any of our discussions. Because infrastructure is boring. And I love it. <laughs> no, it's not. We all love it. <laughs> You're among friends here, Dan. Um, I understand I don't, there are no questions in New York as of now, but I do want to first acknowledge um, that, Bob Howard, your hand is raised. I'm not sure is that from the last discussion or this one. No, just just uh, uh, on this one, add on comment. I want to uh, join Rory and Basil in, in in saying we really need to look at the manufactured and mobile homes. And and in the part of the state I live in, uh, there's a lot of mobile home parks in the area. Uh, that's where the economically disadvantaged are, are mostly housed. And, and looking at the uh, energy and efficiency and the greenhouse gas emissions with those, I think should be a really high priority. It would strike me as a one of the low hanging fruits to help the economically disadvantaged is to rebuild those communities to uh, to an appropriate scale of resiliency, energy efficiency, and low greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm glad to see the attention brought to it. Yeah. I want to acknowledge, I believe, Riot is now online. Um, can I just check your audio, um, Riot, please? Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Wow. Nice yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, there's an uh, echo, but you do seem to be at least able to, to weigh in. Is there anything you wanted to add? Okay. I will take that as a no. Um, thank I'm you, Mark. Uh, the, the tech issues have made it a bit difficult, but thank you for asking. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Raya. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, glad uh, we started with you after uh, cutting it short last meeting. Um, the next slide, um, we're going to hand it over to Jessica Waldorf, Chief of Staff and Director of Policy Implementation for the Department of Public Service to cover the gas system transition. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm here again today to provide a report, a report out on public comments received on the draft scope plan. <coughs> related to the chapter on gas system transition. The next several slides will highlight some key themes related to uh, the public comments that we received. And uh, this particular chapter had the benefit of also having a subgroup that was focused on the development of a framework to guide the development of a statewide gas system transition plan that was recommended in the draft scoping plan. And while we will not be Discussing the specific details of the subgroup's work that's been reported out in prior meetings, the staff recommendations to the chapter revisions will highlight some key points based on the work of that subgroup. And with that, next slide, please. So many commenters expressed a strong support of the rapid and just transition away from the use of fossil fuels. 
Specifically, Commodore supported a ban on new gas hookups, new investments in the gas system, and zero emission standards for appliances to assist with the phase out of fossil fuel appliances. Public comments also included differing viewpoints on the potential use of alternative fuels. Several commenters expressed concerns with emissions impacts and cost of alternative fuels and the need for a just transition plan for the gas utility workers, highlighting the potential for them to assist with the development of thermal energy networks. Uh, several commenters expressed concerns on the flip side of that with the elimination of energy choices and increased costs related to home heating needs. Specifically, comments focused on an all fee above approach, quote unquote, that looks at a variety of options to meet building heating and hot water needs. Additionally, commenters expressed strong support of the CLCPA, noting some concerns about the need to ensure overall energy system reliability and the need for coordinated planning of the transition of the gas system along with the increasing build out of the electric system. Next slide, please. Many comments were received expressing concerns about cost impacts to small businesses and specifically comments from the restaurant industry expressing concerns about costs, but also about resiliency with the need for systems that can accommodate the ability to continue operations during power outages, given the critical role that commercial kitchens play with feeding the most vulnerable residents during emergencies. Lastly, additional comments focus on the need to ensure energy affordability, equity, and enhance consumer education. Specifically, comments centered on the need to prioritize funding for energy efficiency and electrification efforts in disadvantaged communities and in low-income housing, as well as the need for a detailed cost analysis and statewide consumer education plan, highlighting energy options, timing for the transition away from the use of fossil fuels, and the impacts and benefits to consumers. And with that, next slide, please. There were two main comments from the Climate Justice Working Group that focused and centered on gas system transition. The first related to the need for a cost-effective, equitable, and just transition away from gas infrastructure. The Climate Justice Working Group expressed the need for progress to be prioritized in disadvantaged communities where co-pollutants pose a high cumulative burden and the support for denial of fossil gas infrastructure permits. The draft scoping plan addressed this feedback by calling for a detailed analysis to determine the most equitable and cost-effective strategy for transitioning from, away from fossil gas while maintaining affordable, safe, and reliable service. It also calls for the state to develop a comprehensive equity strategy to prioritize the needs of low to moderate income households and disadvantaged communities in the transition to ensure that they are not left behind. The second comment focused on the need to reduce fugitive emissions from gas infrastructure, including the capping of abandoned wells and the need to focus on alternative sources of funding versus solely public funding for this work. The draft scoping plan does not indicate where funding to properly plug an abandoned wells would come from, but rather states that appropriate funding sources should be identified to locate, plug, and abandon these wells. Currently, the oil and gas industry provides funding through financial security requirements and well permit fees, but these are insufficient to properly, properly plug and abandon the inventory of known orphan wells in New York. Staff recommends revising the draft scoping plan to include a recommendation to adjust the financial security amounts in environmental conservation law to cover the true cost of this work. Public funds will be necessary to cover the cost for plugging unmapped wells with unknown ownership. Next slide, please. So, based on the public comments received, staff recommends the following items for con consideration and potential revisions to the scoping plan. First, staff recommends including the framework for development of a statewide gas system transition plan that is currently under consideration by the full Climate Action Council. This systemically addresses the concerns that were raised in public comments. The substantive public comments received on this topic were carefully reviewed by the subgroup uh, in developing this framework and in discussion about other potential revisions recommended for this chapter to both ensure alignment with the framework, the need and the need for a comprehensive statewide planning effort, both of which will ensure the just transition away from the use of fossil fuels. Staff also recommends the chapter emphasize the need for a coordinated planning effort for the transition of the gas system alongside the build out of the electric system to address the comments related to concerns about overall energy system reliability and resiliency. 
Staff also recommends clarifying that the transition included strategic downsizing of the gas system and substantial reduction in fossil gas use. Part of the discussion in the last meeting of the gas transition subgroup highlighted the importance of maintaining the language on downsizing, ensuring that it is done strategically and that it accomplishes the need to significantly reduce fossil gas use. On the topic of alternative fuels, staff recommends addressing the feedback received in public comment by clarifying the potential for strategic use of these fuels, such as renewable natural gas or green hydrogen, and gas system planning to meet customer needs for uses such as process use and manufacturing, where electrification is not yet feasible or to decarbonize the gas system as it transitions. However, staff recommends that the scoping plan align with the recommendations from the gas system transition subgroup to clarify that any use of alternative fuels should contribute to achieving the overarching emissions reduction requirements of the CLCPA, the recommendations of the scoping plan on the need to significantly decarbonize the building sector, and the integration analysis scenarios that show an overall limited role for the use of these alternative fuels. Additionally, staff recommends that the statewide gas system transition plan include that additional analysis to evaluate the greenhouse gas emissions and co-pollutant impacts co-pollutant emissions impacts um, to determine the impacts on energy affordability, safety, and reliability prior to consideration for use of these fuels in the existing gas system infrastructure. Staff recommends that the scoping plan ensure the statewide transition plan that gets developed includes a detailed cost and benefits analysis and mitigates concerns raised by public commenters about disproportionate impacts to vulnerable consumers, including low-income residents and disadvantaged communities. Additionally, that public funding be prioritized for energy efficiency upgrades and electrification initiatives for distressed housing, low and moderate income households, affordable and public housing, and buildings that are located in disadvantaged communities. Lastly, and equally as important as the other recommendations here and within the gas system transition subgroups framework, staff recommends that the final scoping plan underscore the importance of a clear plan for the just transition of the gas industry, that includes a focus on workforce development, training opportunities, and a timeline for what this transition means and when. This should also address the comments raised about the need for increased consumer outreach and education. Specifically, the final scoping plan should ensure the statewide plan outline how a, communi how a communication strategy and consumer education plan will be executed, provide information on how the transition of the gas system will expand consumer choice, including increased utility energy offerings and business model reforms, enhance resiliency as opposed to reducing it with increased energy efficient electrification, energy storage, and reduced price volatility due to less reliance on fossil fuels, and potential consideration of, of the strategic use of alternative fuels. And with that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, looking here in Albany, any questions for Jessica? Okay. How about New York City? Any any questions in New York City? Yeah. Hi, it's Peter Iwanowitz. Um, just going back to a point I think I made at the last meeting, I'm curious as to the staff recommendations and how are they, whether you think they are inconsistent or consistent with the recommendations that came out of the Alt Fuels Working Group that suggested that things like renewable natural gas should be used on site and not combusted and the prioritization of ensuring that we um, comply with the letter of the law that doesn't see a, a net increase of co-pollutants in disadvantaged communities. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, since the staff recommendations here are in alignment with the recommendations that I reported out the gas system transition subgroup at the last meeting, um, same answer applies. I think we are in alignment and uh, specifically the recommendations that we would propose uh, would note the additional analysis that would be needed and the careful planning for how or if alternative fuels fit into uh, future gas system planning efforts. Thank you. Any other questions from New York City? Okay. Um, 
Ned, how about uh, online? I guess that would be Bob. Uh, sorry, I don't have a note as to whether your hand is raised. Bob, did you have any feedback? Uh, yeah, yes, it is raised. Thank you. Thank, oh, you, thank, you, and th thank you, Jessica, for that uh, summary. You covered a lot of material. I think it's, uh, uh, I agree with the staff recommendations, and I think you've uh, well and fairly captured much of the discussion we had in the, in the uh, working group behind this. Uh, I would just uh, urge perhaps a little bit more clarity in the, in the middle uh, bullet of the, of the page it's up now. Uh, it, it's fine to say that, uh, you know, we need more study on renewable natural gas and green hydrogen, and it's hard to argue against that. But, but you know, my, my sense is both out of this group and out of the uh, alternative fuels group is, is that there was a, a, a consensus that we were thought RNG was generally best used on site and that green hydrogen should not be put into pipelines that would be servicing homes. And, and we can discuss, you know, particular cases where maybe RNG could be used in homes and pipelines, but it'd be a narrow use that, that's consistent throughout our discussion. And in, in terms of hydrogen, there, there are just so many reasons to think that it's a bad idea to put it into pipelines that service homes. But I would hope that our final language would be uh, clear, clear on that guidance. Thank you. Hi, if this is Raya, I'll chime in now because of my limitations. I just wanted to agree with agree with Bob, and also just that also in that middle point, this idea of any strategic use aligned with integration scenarios. Um, really, the point there is that an understanding that if there's an opportunity, and many of us, of course, believe that there's not, that it is very small, um, and that any contemplated um, thought about it should be kept to the um, to the levels, you know, the very low opportunity levels. And yes, um, with the preference for on site, as um, as Bob stated. Thank you. Don, back to Albany. Yeah, thank you, Doreen, um, and, and thank you, Jessica. Uh, so this is Donna. You know, I attended every one of those uh, gas system transition meetings, and I guess I just don't agree with the characterization uh, that was just described um, by the prior two council members. I do think the slides are accurate as to the um, the, you know, the, the group's discussion, and I think they're a good documentation, as were, um, I think, the slides presented at the prior meeting uh, for the framework. So I guess I just don't, I, I don't want to, by saying nothing, somehow agree with what was just said. So thank you. Well, we certainly had consensus on the, the point on several calls with, as, as Peter had mentioned, when we talked with the alt fuels group about the on-site preference. And let me be clear, I mean, myself and many others don't think we should be doing this at all. <laughs> and have been very strongly in opposition, you know, to that. Um, but, uh, you know, so I, I think that to Peter and Bob's point, that was certainly in the consensus. Yeah, I don't think it's in front of us, but I think Jessica hit it. I think there was a point that just said basically that any use would have to comply with CLCPA. I mean, I think that was really what we all agreed on. But it's that, that's the way I'm remembering it, so thank you. Maybe, um, this is Jessica, but maybe another way to round that out is uh, while there may be a preference, we didn't exclude the possibility for yes. other potential uses. And that is why you see the, the very tiny on the screen, <laughs> but expansive language about um, you know, the additional analysis that would be needed in those instances, well, in every instance for the consideration of those fuels. So thank you. And thank you. And I, I won't, I won't, I'll keep my comments brief because I know I can't raise my hand, but I just wanted to go ahead and say that um, myself and, and several others, you know, feel very strongly that the RNG and um, blending ideas are false solutions that shouldn't be deployed at all. Uh, so I just <laughs> wanted to go ahead and make that, that very clear. And are, you know, and are disappointed, you know, um, in that, in that, but just making that clear. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Raya. Um, and, and I, sorry, just, just one thing. Raya, um, we'll have to just figure out a way to, to get you integrated into this hand-raising process. Yeah. Um, Dennis's card is up here in Albany. Yeah, I, I just want to make sure that it's understood that 
I certainly didn't agree with the level of the ability of looking at these alternatives uh, we, that was not part of our conversation. So essentially because we actually don't know. And so until we actually start implementing what we're all talking about here, um, I don't know what level of penetration we can explore these options uh, personally unless uh, Carl's got something in his magic uh, box over there. I don't see that. So I, I, wanted, I want to make sure that we're just looking at this with open minds as opposed to some predetermined outcome. I just think we've got to let the applications and the demonstrations and the pilots start to adjust our thinking going forward is my thought. Okay, so I am going to ask um, for the purposes of, of RISE connectivity that you please um, find a way with the CADMIS team to notify us if you, if you want to weigh in. Um, so Raya, if you could just send a note to the CADMIS team, that's probably the best way we can do that given your connectivity today. Um, thank you, Jessica. Thanks and for your leadership on the subgroup as well. Thank you. Sorry, Doreen, we have two questions here in New York. Okay, so, sorry. You're not done, Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's Roberta Reardon. I just wanted to say I'm on the gas transition subgroup as well. And we had an incredibly robust discussion about this. And I think the way that Jessica framed it is probably the closest to consensus that we could get because there are definitely people who have very strong opinions on one side of this, but there's also a very strong feeling from a number of the members of the committee that people want to know more. And uh, as Dennis said, I'm, I think the interest was to explore these opportunities and not be shutting things out before we know what we're shutting out. Given that people have very strong feelings about it. Thank you. All right, Paul Shep's in here. Well, you know, I, I will agree with something that, that uh, Donna said, and, and that is that use of renewable hydrogen um, should be done if it's consistent with the objectives of the CLCPA. And uh, it is true that there, there's been a wide range of perspectives on this. I think that the document should express that there were grave concerns expressed about using hydrogen in a way that, that blends it with natural gas. I'm certainly among those who express grave concerns. And my concern is that it is a mechanism that would lead to extending and increasing the use of natural gas because we're using uh, natural gas as a mechanism for storing and transmitting renewable hydrogen. And uh, I want it to be clear that, that at least some of us feel that it, sh it should be clear that this is an issue that should be resolved through extensive study of the long-term impacts of, of using uh, green hydrogen in that way. I, I, I really think the document should make it clear that there are serious concerns that have been expressed and multiple members of the CAC. Great, thank you for that, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you again, Jessica. I think we've closed out the comments um, on this topic. If we turn to the next slide, I believe um, we've been joined by Vanessa Ulmer, who is the team lead for policy development at NYSERDA and who has been uh, leading much of the analytic work around our building strategy and the strategy itself. So um, Vanessa, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Doreen. Um, good afternoon. Again, my name is Vanessa Ulmer, and I have had the pleasure of being on the interagency staff team 
supporting first the Energy Efficiency and Housing Advisory Panel to this council, and then the development of the buildings chapter in the scoping plan. So in the public comment period, we actually received thousands of written and verbal comments which touched on the buildings chapter. So this points to the importance of buildings in our quality of life and in our communities. So before I offer a necessarily whirlwind summary, I do wanna thank the many individuals and stakeholder organizations who provided comments and also thank the interagency team um, for diligently helping to synthesize their valued input. Next slide, please. So as you know, the draft buildings chapter proposes strategies to adopt zero emissions codes and equipment standards in the building sector. We received many comments that spoke directly to these two strategies, both in support and in opposition. Many commenters expressed strong support for the adoption of state codes that require new construction to be highly efficient, zero emission, and resilient. Those in support tended to agree with the dates included in the draft plan. Some urged somewhat earlier dates for multifamily and commercial buildings up to five or six stories. A variant proposed to this strategy uh, was to focus codes on removing on-site fossil fuel combustion in new buildings rather than requiring new construction to be, quote, all electric, per se. Many commenters also indicated specific support for setting state zero emission standards that prohibit replacement of gas or oil heating and hot water equipment and gas appliances with clear dates that allow the market time to adjust. Those in support, again, tended to agree with the dates included in the plan. They also urged dedicated assistance for low and moderate income households and in disadvantaged communities, as well as complementary market development efforts and incentives for early adopters. Another theme was the importance of pairing electrification with thermal energy efficiency in buildings. Relatedly, one variant proposed was to establish was to establish emissions and energy efficiency standards for equipment where doing so is not preempted by the federal government. Another variant proposed was to apply emission standards in the shorter term to primary space heating equipment and in the longer term to validate grid reliability for, before requiring all supplemental heater sales to be all electric or zero emission. On the other hand, and on the right hand of uh, this slide, many commenters expressed strong opposition to regulatory codes and standards that would require zero emissions building systems. In general, these commenters urged New York State to avoid regulations or mandates in this area, and instead to pursue incentives and market transformation activities to increase market, de market demand for low emission technologies. Commenters with this view emphasized consumer choice and tended to urge keeping multiple heating options available across electric heat pumps, dual fuel heating systems, wood and low carbon fuels, including biodiesel, renewable natural gas, and hydrogen. Commenters from the hospitality industry specifically requested that commercial kitchen equipment be exempted from regulatory standards. Another noteworthy theme is that some commenters believe the needs of rural and upstate communities were not adequately reflected in the draft scoping plan. With respect to buildings, they expressed that rural households depend on gas or delivered fuels due to their reliability as compared to above ground electric wires that are more vulnerable to power outages in storms. Some also questioned the reliability of heat pumps in very cold temperatures. Commenters were divided on the reliability, uh, re commenters were divided on wood burning, either supporting wood burning as an option in rural areas or expressing concern about the associated public health impacts. Next slide, please. I'll now speed up a bit to cover comments that are equally important yet have a fair amount of overlap with report outs from other chapter leads, including from Jessica just before this. First, commenters broadly called for thoughtful attention to the cost of transitioning to alternative technologies and expressed concern about disproportionate impacts on low and moderate income households, disadvantaged communities, and those on a fixed income, as well as costs to small businesses. Commenters noted that equity must be centered and that all state agencies should assess the consumer costs from individual new regulations in the development and implementation process. With respect to the energy system, some commenters questioned the reliability of electric grid infrastructure with wide scale electrification. Commenters generally were divided in their views toward the use of biofuels, renewable natural gas, 
and green hydrogen in the future building sector. And utility companies called for optimizing across the gas and the electric system. Multiple stakeholder coalitions also called for strategies to accelerate and scale up thermal energy networks, including regulatory planning and expedited siting and permitting processes. Next slide, please. With respect to our workforce for building decarbonization, commenters expressed broad support for the draft strategy to invest in workforce development and training, notably in ways that, that engage existing tra trades and that improve outcomes for workers from disadvantaged communities. Commenters noted that workforce readiness is important to account for in implementation timeframes and recommended certain additional analyses. There were specific calls to develop a trained workforce of craftspeople to restore and retrofit existing and historic buildings to promote building reuse and reduce embodied carbon. Consistent with the draft buildings chapter, commenters also broadly expressed support for continued state investment in market development and innovation strategies to accelerate building decarbonization. This extended across support for public outreach and consumer education, research and development, expanding New York-based technologies in manufacturing, and promoting the reuse of buildings and building materials. The draft buildings chapter includes a strategy to advance a managed and just transition from reliance on hydrofluorocarbon, or HFC use, and we did receive a number of comments specifically on this topic. With respect to the timing of the transition, some industry representatives commented that New York State should not seek a faster transition to lower global warming potential refrigerants than what the EPA will implement nationwide under the AIM Act. They cited concerns about feasibility and also leakage, because at the national level, fewer allocations of HFCs to New York would allow greater allocations in other states. Commenters also urged more attention in the scoping plan to address commercial refrigeration as the single largest source of HFC emissions in the state. This included a recommendation to provide rebates and low cost loans for purchase of low emission refrigeration systems, as well as dedicated support for food stores in disadvantaged communities. Next slide, please. A very common theme in public comments was support for financial incentives and, re and reduced interest rate financing for building decarbonization, which are two strategies included in the draft chapter. Commenters placed emphasis on making incentives and financing available for geothermal heat pumps, for air sealing and insulation, for pairing thermal efficiency with electrification, and to motivate the replacement of heating systems before failure. Commenters also recommended the creation of a revolving loan fund as a way to make large pools of capital accessible to buildings. Numerous commenters urged New York State to dedicate and to better coordinate public assistance for energy efficiency and electrification for low and moderate income households, affordable housing, and in disadvantaged communities, while improving housing conditions and safety. This is also a point of emphasis in the draft chapter. Specifically, commenters called for at least $1 billion per year to assist LMI households with energy efficient electrification, or relatedly, to capitalize a retrofit and electrification readiness fund. Finally, comments addressed protections for tenants, consumers, and lower income households. Commenters expressed the need for fair safeguards so that energy improvements, energy improvements don't drive significant rent increases. And commenters also urged expanding low income energy utility bill assistance programs, including by adopting a needs based focus and eliminating funding caps. Next slide, please. With regard to the Climate Justice Working Group feedback, there is one area that we identified as unresolved, which is that the working group called for a more expansive set of actions related to consumer protection. A number of public comments expressed support for the working group's feedback in this regard, and specifically urged that the Climate Justice Working Group recommendations shown on the lower half of this slide be included in the final scoping plan. These include a utility customer bill of rights, a safety net guarantee of affordable renewable energy, public education related to the energy system, and clawback provisions around public subsidies to landlords to mitigate rent increases and displacement. Next slide, please. 
I'll now turn to share recommendations from the interagency staff team. Uh, these are summarized in four additional slides. First, the staff team recognizes the cross-cutting importance of consumer protections and climate justice, including the need to make renewable energy affordable and accessible. In the final buildings chapter, we propose to clarify that the Home Energy Fair Practices Act and existing regulations do establish protections for customers of New York State utility companies. The draft chapter text already speaks to the Public Service Commission's energy affordability policy. We'd like to expand upon that content to address ensuring that current or future public utility bill assistance programs account for increased cooling needs and also for the shift to efficient electrification. We further propose to add community solar as a new strategy component in the chapter. This would address support for community solar projects that provide electric bill savings to income eligible households or that benefit affordable housing or public buildings in disadvantaged communities with program rules that direct benefits to residents. And within the chapter's public awareness and consumer education strategy, we propose adding explicit attention to education around how to participate in public and regulatory processes. We'll also expand discussion in the building's chapter of distinctions between upstate and downstate New York with respect to urban and rural communities, climate zones in the state, uh, building stock and socioeconomic factors, and potential impacts in the plan. This includes providing typical costs for efficient building electrification for additional building types. And we'll incorporate recent analytic work conducted to inform the council, notably the building sector sensitivities from the integration analysis that were presented today. Our staff team also has reviewed the New York State Disadvantaged Communities Barriers and Opportunities Report. We're happy to see substantial alignment between this report and the draft buildings chapter. In certain cases, we can make this linkage more apparent, for example, by adjusting specific phrasing. Next slide, please. I'll now speak to proposed revisions to the building's chapter strategies on zero emission codes and standards. Strategy B1 in the draft chapter addresses state codes for new construction. We'll update the chapter to describe the New York State Advanced Building Codes, Appliance, and Equipment Efficiency Standard Act of 2022. This recently enacted act facilitates future updates to the energy code to align with the Climate Act. The code updates will be developed with full public engagement through the Code Council process and also will account for life cycle cost analysis. The New York Code Council plans to next update the state energy code after the next model International Energy Conservation Code is published in 2024. Code updates then historically follow a three-year cycle. As a practical matter, based on this timing, we propose to adjust certain dates by one year to 2025 for advanced state code for low-rise residential buildings and to 2028 for the same for multifamily buildings over three stories and for commercial buildings. We also recommend revising the date to 2025 to prohibit utilities from providing new gas service to existing buildings and to commence a state benchmarking program. I'll now speak to specific text revisions, which are shown on the slide. We propose revising the text of strategy B1 to strike the term all electric. As shown on the slide, the revised text would speak to the adoption of state codes that prohibit building systems or equipment, equipment used for the combustion of fossil fuels in new construction statewide. We recommend a comparable text revision to strategy B2, also shown on the slide, which would read, adopt zero emission standards that prohibit replacements at end of useful life of gas or oil combustion equipment for heating, cooling, and hot water. We suggest it's also important to described directly in the chapter that any state emission standards for building equipment will be developed and proposed through a full public engagement and regulatory process. Such standards shall ensure that compliance will not disproportionately burden disadvantaged communities, which is in fact a requirement in the law. The standards development process would consider consumer costs and benefits, technical industry and grid readiness, building level resilience, and the potential for future connection to clean thermal energy networks. 
Next slide, please. Speaking of thermal energy networks, or TENS, we propose to add a new strategy to the building's chapter that is focused on supporting the development of thermal energy networks that provide a clean heating solution for buildings and a just transition employment path for gas utility workers. We would describe the recent legislation and the PSC implementation process in this space. We would appreciate the Council's input and direction on this new strategy, which could include part partnership on workforce training for gas sector workers to operate TENS, streamlined regulations and lower permit fees for deep geothermal wells as compared to rules that are really designed for oil and gas operations, streamlined access to public and utility rights of way, proactive mapping of heat sources, public-private partnerships for financing and development, and prioritizing TENS that serve affordable housing and disadvantaged communities. I'll pick up the pace once more to review recommended revisions to other strategies in the building chapter. For public financial incentives and access to low-cost financing, we'll update discussion of federal funding and tax credits. We intend to underscore the significant investment of public funding that is needed to both decarbonize and improve the quality of housing for lower-income households. The public investment also needs to align with the proposed timelines for new, for new codes and standards. In discussion of incentives for building decarbonization, we believe it is appropriate to further highlight the importance of thermal efficiency measures like air sealing and insulation, the benefits of ground source heat pumps, and motivating upgrades before heating system failure. We'd like to add a recommendation that for projects that receive state or utility incentives for heat pumps or other upgrades, data on the installed costs be collected and published. The goal here is to increase market transparency on costs. We will also add detail on the HCR sustainability guidelines and housing plan that were released this year, as well as on support offered to lenders. Next slide, please. For the workforce development strategy, we believe the draft is substantively consistent with public input. We can provide a more standardized presentation of each key workforce segment and the training priorities for that segment. And consistent with guidance from this council at a prior meeting, we'll do our best to communicate associated timeframes for training to support a just transition. For, for the public awareness and consumer education strategy, we propose to place more emphasis on increasing public awareness of new and upcoming regulatory requirements, as well as how to participate in public and regulatory processes and in the clean energy economy broadly. For the strategy to transition from reliance on HFC use, the HFC, sorry, the interagency staff team does not recommend adjusting the state regulatory timeline since the existing process aligns with the Climate Act emissions limit. We do recommend that the chapter strategy delineate between training and education as compared to cash incentives, and that it endorse incentives for the purchase of low emission commercial refrigeration systems. Finally, we will update references to recent federal, state, and local legislation, executive orders, PSC orders, and agency guidance. Across all levels of government, we've seen key actions taken in this past year toward reducing emissions from the building sector in a manner that centers equity. We appreciate the Council's direction towards a strong set of final strategies in the buildings chapter that will further accelerate this momentum so that more New Yorkers can live, work, and learn in homes and buildings that are high performance, healthy, and comfortable. We welcome your input and any questions. Thank you, Vanessa. I am expecting there will be questions. Uh, here in Albany, um, why don't we start with Dennis, please? Thank you, Dory. Yeah, uh, Vanessa, thank you. Uh, great overview. Um, in terms of, when we say community solar, are you referring to community solar in terms of co-location of supply and demand or remote location of supply given the benefits to, let's say, the community? Dennis, that strategy could um, include either of those options. So we could have community solar projects, um, which are not cited directly on an affordable housing complex, for example, but where the bill credits are made available to low-income households. Uh, we also would point to the opportunities to locate 
community solar or solar installations on affordable housing and provide for benefits to flow directly to the residents of that housing. Yeah, Vanessa, the reason I ask is that, um, you know, location-based supply, just like location-based demand, consumes the same hosting capacity of, of the local distribution system. So maybe, you know, just want to make sure that we're aware of that uh, because we tend to just look at load, uh, but it's really uh, irrelevant to the distribution system. It's load and supply. Uh, my my, my uh, second uh, inquiry is when we talk about uh, building codes, uh, and I, I mentioned this, I think, to, to Carl a little earlier, um, our building codes, because we're a home rule state, we actually rely on local fire marshals to make determinations, which if it's not in the building code, the determination tends to be you can't do it. So as we look at the technologies, whether or not they're electric storage, uh, chemical storage, or thermal storage, we, we are you looking at ensuring that those are all framed within your uh, the recommendations for advancing building codes that actually support CLCPA objectives? Yeah, thank you, Dennis. And I appreciate that that you've um, encouraged attention to this, um, you know, in, in past meetings as well. So we recognize the importance of resilience features in buildings, including energy and thermal storage, um, to build that into state codes. So we do have a recommendation in the draft chapter now, which is to adopt additional building resilience features into state codes that require energy storage or on-site renewable generation that is able to disconnect from the grid um, or at minimum you know, storage readiness. But I'd be happy to, to follow up with you to see if, you know, what we have right now is uh, appropriately addressing uh, the points that you're, you're, you're bringing forward. I would actually like that. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Dennis. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, this is Rory. Hi, Vanessa. Um, I have a question about, I think, uh, B1. Would you mind going back to that slide? It's, it's a two-part clarifying question and then... Uh, comment. So I think in B1, you had mentioned about the responsibility of cooling and heating being born. I, I just want to make sure I understood uh, what you meant when you mentioned that. Something about the provision? That, I, I, I couldn't quite hear you. Could you just repeat that, the responsibility? Sure. I'll, I'll, I'll speak louder and project to the ceiling. Um, <laughs> early in the presentation, and I believe it is for strat one of the B strategies, you mentioned uh, something about uh, taking on cooling uh, for individuals, renters or, or low-income individuals. And I wanted to just make sure I understood what you meant in that instance, because I did, you went by it, moved on to the next topic, and I didn't quite register. Sure. So we might want to actually go back one, um, one slide. So I think that what you're referencing is we recommended that in discussion of the Commission's energy affordability policy and other public utility bill assistance programs, that those programs adjust for increased cooling needs. So recognize that low-income households will need uh, access to cooling services as the, as the climate warms um, and that support would be available for that. Thank you for clarifying. And, and my comment uh, is connected to that a bit. So. Uh, in certain parts of the state, New York City, Westchester, and a few other areas, there are specific requirements for the provision of heat. Um, and it could be something rather complicated where the outside temperature must be 55 degrees, and at which point the inside temperature must be 62 degrees. Or it could simply be after a certain time of day, the indoor temperature must be 60 degrees. Whatever it is, you can find minimum requirements for heating. Um, yep. There exist no similar requirements for cooling. And I think about this in the context of that comment, but also given the conversation just presented to us by Mr. Moss about the need for better control over temperatures in the buildings. And so I wonder if there are any recommendations about laws establishing bands of acceptability for suitable indoor temperatures during particular seasons. 
Is that something that was discussed or considered? And if not, could it be included and discussed in any subsequent meetings before the final version of this? Yeah, thank you, Rory. That's, that's not directly um, addressed in the draft buildings chapter at present, and it's not something that we brought directly uh, in our staff recommendations today. Um, but I, I do think your comment would resonate uh, with the staff team, and I know that, you know, this, the state is also working on an extreme heat action plan, among other, um, other related policy processes. Um, so definitely noting that down, and I'd welcome comments from any other, um, any other council members, um, and then our, our interagency team will, will take this into account. <clears throat> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Donna. Thanks, Doreen. Thanks. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, you know, I was really pleased to see the recommendation. I think it was a staff recommendation. I don't remember on which slide about um, differences and distinctions you're going to be looking at for upstate versus downstate and, and you know, some of the, the different, you know, um, building stock differences and all of that. So my question is, how is it that you know, when you look at some of the recommendations, and I guess I think it was B1, B2, et cetera, they're statewide recommendations when we're going to be looking at regional differences. So, you know, for example, again, I'll pick on Western New York because that's where I am. Um, you know, we might have different strategies, but yet we're going to have statewide kind of requirements and mandates. So how do you align that um, as, you, as, as we look at this chapter? Yeah, thank you, Donna. So just want to underscore that, that these are policy recommendations that then have a significant amount of regulatory process uh, in the implementation phase. So with respect to new construction codes, and if we think about climate zones, there, there could be the opportunity to set some differences in new construction code that tie to, to climate zone, for example. And I think that's already the case with respect to the level of insulation that's required for, for each climate zone. Um, so that's, that's one example of where a regulatory process could take more, more granular detail into account. I do think that that is, on face value, more challenging when we think about equipment standards um, for the obvious reason that you could uh, purchase a piece of equipment in one county and you know, drive to the next county um, so that's something that I think we'll need, we'll need careful attention, again, in the forthcoming re regulatory process. Did that provide enough of an answer? Because I feel like I'm, I'm to some extent, you know, pointing ahead um, to future process. Um, but I think our staff team here does want to be kind of cognizant about what this scoping plan can cover and then what will need much more detailed um, regulatory actions that would follow. Yeah, I think it was helpful for me, but um, I, I think it's I think it's an issue. So I guess I guess I, how how do we think through that? Yeah. Yep, I appreciate that, Donna. So we will we will keep thinking um, and recognize that uh, we may still fall in a, in a somewhat kind of overarching um, space in this document um, once you see the red lines. But we'll definitely keep thinking about this point. Thank, thank you. So may I ask one more? Or, okay. Um, yeah, I'm also just curious when you when you think about um, and I and I, I I don't know how it's maybe it's a chicken and an egg thing. You know, we have um, recommendations that are part of the gas transition framework that talk about integrating the um, planning process for gas and electricity systems um, and how they evolve during the transition. Um, how did do, how does that get considered as we think about these kinds of um, statewide kind of requirements, I'm going to say. You know, and again, this is the question that was raised by some of the um, commenters about choice and options versus mandates, you know, incentives versus mandates. So, so I'm just curious, how do we think about integrating um, those things? Yeah, thank you, Donna. So I think that the time frame and the phasing of the regulatory recommendations are very important. So there's, of course, a reason that the recommendation is that the earliest proposed date is for new construction of single-family homes and low-rise buildings. Um, there's not 
that much new construction in our state, and that's an area where we have a significant number of proof points of homes that are built to an excellent standard and are very comfortable for occupants um, and are, are built to the type of standard that the, the, the advanced code would point to. Whereas for retrofitting, you know, large buildings, the proposed uh, regulatory timeframe at this point is in 2035. So certainly looking to allow for um, sufficient lead time to see, to see that the market and the technology develops um, that grid readiness is there, and then also to consider uh, the important resilience aspects, which I know you've also, you know, brought to this council's attention, and and certainly we we heard loud and clear in the public comments. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. Um, last year, nominee is Ann Reynolds. Thanks. So I figured someone else would ask. They didn't. I will about the dates. Uh, uh, so. Maybe it would be helpful to know that slide. I don't know. But so the building code is not going to be changed until 2025. Is that what it said? You said the next one? Yep. So the, the code council in New York is currently planning to wait until release of the model code, which is the International Energy Conservation Code. There's a comparable model code, ASHRAE 90.1, for commercial buildings. So our state code council um, is planning its next update to the state code following the release of those model codes in 2024. And so the, the shift, the proposed shift in the date um, reflects our staff's assessment of what's practical uh, given that timing, because we, we would need to see the publication of the model code, which our Department of State is very close to, so that's that's not a that's not a surprise for the public and certainly for our agency. Um, but but the code council uh, would want that to be published and then to build upon that. Um, indeed, the the legislation, um, the Advanced Building Codes, Appliance and, and Equipment Efficiency Standards Act of 2022, strongly encourages the code council to set efficiency standards that exceed this next IECC model code. But the shift in dates is our staff team's assessment of what, what's practical given those kind of time, timing contingencies. So a couple of questions. How long does it take the building code council typically to go from starting the process to issuing the final code? Like if they start after 2024's um, model is published, is it, is it a two-year process or could it be done by 2025? And then it would affect new buildings starting when? So say it's issued in 2025, is then it possible to say this affects new buildings? Does it say this in front of me? Does it, <laughs> the date that it would, would impact for new construction? And then the other part of the question is, the building code would also have the dates and deadlines for retrofits in it? So like it could be issued in 2025, but say this goes into starting in 2035, your retrofit has to be either all electric or no combustion or fossil fuel. That was a multi-part yes, question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to work backwards. So strategy B1 with respect to advanced building codes is specific to new construction and major rehabilitations or gut renovations that would trigger new construction code. So it's really strategy B2 that would affect more standard uh, equipment replacement and retrofit cycle. So with respect to new construction or you know, uh, major rehabilitations that, that the code applies to, um, the intent of this recommendation is that by 2025, a building that was pulling a permit um, for construction, that this code would be in effect and applicable by 2025. And, and again, we think that's um, a fairly aggressive time frame for going from a model code to a, a code being enacted and like in effect um, for, for buildings. Now, if a, if a building had kind of already Hold their construction permit, you know, in December 2024, you will have a phase-in period. Um, but small buildings, I think, would tend to pull their construction permits 
with less, less advance notice as compared to, to large buildings. Um, so the goal is that in 2025, uh, most will rise new construction under this proposal would be subject to the advanced building code. And in terms of your, your overarching question about like the, the, the total cycle time, I don't know that very specifically. Um, so I'll have to get back to you on that, Anne. My, again, I, I don't, I don't mean to suggest that the code council is not going to do anything until the model codes are released. So I think that there is probably an opportunity for the code council to, you know, begin the public process. Um, but the, the understanding that I've gained from our codes experts at NYSERDA and from our colleagues at the Department of State is that given the release of these model codes in 2024, having advanced codes in, in place and applicable in 2025 is really a very aggressive time frame. Yeah, thank you, um, Vanessa. I am looking at the clock. We're, we're going to have to pick up the pace here a little. Um, so, Gavin um, from Albany, and then we'll move to New York City. Just a quick question. Um, there's obviously a lot to take in here. Um, what I wanted to, to ask is part of the analysis and the work that's going into this, has there been any analysis about regional costs associated for complying with these requirements? And for example, what it would cost in Albany versus Buffalo or Albany versus New York City. And two, more importantly to me, I mean, costs are really important to me, but the affordability side, how folks are gonna be able to afford this as building owners. Have, has there been any analysis as part of, part of the recommendations here? Yeah, thank you for that, Gavin. So we do have estimates of regional cost differences. The integration analysis, because it's a statewide model, um, actually used some, some regional cost estimates and rolled those up into a statewide average for the purpose of the integration analysis modeling. I mean, I, I will also say that right now we have the best estimates and the best data for the cost of retrofitting single family homes. Um, and then also, you know, an, an expanding data set for zero emissions and very high performance new construction, which are really just, you know, better buildings, building, be building, building buildings to a better standard. Um, where we have limited data at this point is for retrofitting larger multifamily buildings. Um, and there's a, there's a wide diversity in the commercial space. So again, kind of across that diverse set of commercial institutional buildings, uh, the, the data set is not as robust. So I guess the answer is that we do have um, regional estimates and our, our kind of highest confidence for smaller buildings. Uh, and, but this is a region, this is a reason that the staff team recommended making data on cost of installations more widely available when there's a public incentive um, that, that, you know, cost shares that project so that we can continue to increase the transparency around cost. Uh, just to follow up, is, mm -hmm. is there a reason we're not sharing that data, like the regional cost data here? I mean, if you have it, why don't we have it? Sure. Yeah, we can. I mean, there's there's not a reason that we're not sharing it. I think it's more that we've been trying to be um, reasonable about what we ask uh, the council and the public to look at in the in the underlying inputs to our modeling. Um, so we can definitely consider working that in. Again, the, the goal is to provide additional information uh, in the building's chapter text, recognizing that we are still trying to be concise and pithy, um, but to explore these regional differences and recognize that the cost is an important dimension of that. Okay. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, let's see what we have coming in from New York City, please. Hi, this is Mario. Uh, I, I have a I guess a request slash suggestion. Earlier in the uh, in the presentation, there was a mention, I guess, of the building trades. I think it had to do with uh, education and training. But this would also apply to, to the previous presentation or, or really anywhere in the document. <clears throat> I would ask that any time we refer to the workforce uh, in any manner, <clears throat> that we would also include or mention the uh, the applicable labor standards. I think everything that we've talked about 
throughout, whether it was prevailing rate or health and safety standards. If we don't mention it each time throughout, every time we mention the workforce, it sort of diminishes those standards. So I would, I would just request, I mean, I don't think it's anything that any of us don't agree with uh, or that we've, you know, we've discussed throughout. It would be mentioned throughout uh, the document. So. Yeah, thank you for that input. And in the building chapter to date, we've been quite conscious about tying back to the way that um, labor standards are referenced in the just transition chapter. So we'll continue to kind of look for alignment uh, in that respect. Thank you. And like I said, for not just this section, but, but the others, but thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mario. Uh, I have to take a look at the, the point is well taken. I have to take, obviously take a look at the ways in which the term is used throughout, but, but certainly noted, thank you. Um, anyone else in New York City? No? Okay. Um, Bob? Thank you, Doreen, and, and, and thank you, uh, Vanessa. One, one small uh, comment on, on the slide that's up at the moment under strategy two, the second time there. It uh, refers to replacement of gas and oil combustion equipment. I would urge that we add propane to that. I mean, propane is used widely in, in much of the state for home heating, uh, cooking, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that's uh, consistent with that. Uh, beyond that, I mean, it's a, it's a nice summary. I mean, I, I am disappointed, I can't think of another word, that we're postponing the, the dates from 2024 to 2025. And I, I understand the difficulty of trying to move faster, but I would really hope that we not move any more slowly and that we have a real expectation that uh, if we're going to say 2025, we mean 2025. Beyond that, I, uh, I think that we should start projecting to the citizens the states that it's in their interest to try to move faster than what the code would require. I, personally, if I built a new home in 2024 and hooked it up to the gas pipeline system and only found out uh, year later that I was one of the last people there, I'd, I'd feel kind of ripped off. You know, that, that person really would have been better off not doing that. So I think we should start in our educational campaigns and getting that messaging out, even if we're going to postpone these states. Thank you. Thank, yep, thank you for that input, Bob. And just as a very direct response to your first comment, you are correct that gas, oil, and propane, you know, is consistent with the, the intent of that, of that statement. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, appreciate the, the detailed presentation and, um, and the great feedback from everyone. Thank you very much. Um, if we turn to the next slide, uh, we have um, Vince Ravishu with Empire State Development, Senior Vice President for Energy and Incentives to present the industry feedback. Thank you, Doreen. Um, again, my name is Vincent Rabashir, and I'm Senior Vice President for Energy and Empire State Development. I'm joined today by my colleague, Todd Baldoga, the Director of Industrial and Agriculture Market Development Programs at NYSERDA. And we're here to give us feedback on the industry chapter of the draft scoping plan. Uh, next slide. <coughs> Beginning with the public comments. Um, the public comments have been grouped together into four topics. Energy intensive and trade exposed industries or EITEs, GHG emissions benchmarking, alternative compliance mechanisms or ACMs, and low carbon procurement. Uh, the most extensive comments received concerned, um, received concerned EITE industries. Many comments express the view that the scoping plan should include a more detailed definition or listing of EITE industries. Some comments advocated for a specific industry to be identified as EITE. A number of comments recommended that the scoping plan include specifics on how to mitigate compliance costs for EITE so as to prevent leakage and avoid anti-competitive impacts. And other comments went a bit further and identified specific mechanisms that they would like to see uh, incorporated into economy-wide carbon pricing strategies to protect the ITEs, 
such as carbon credits or allocations or outright exemptions um, from regulation. The second group of comments address GHG emissions benchmarking, which is related to the consideration treatment of EITE industries. Some comments express concern that the new requirements or any new requirements might disregard the considerable resources already spent to comply with current rules. And a few comments recommended that the state set industry-specific benchmarks for use in measuring production emission intensity. The third topic of public comment concerns alternative compliance mechanisms, ACMs. Specifically, there was a comment that industry, and in particular EITEs, be offered compliance flexibility by authorizing the use of ACMs based on economic infeasibility if leakage would be likely to occur without that use or without the use of uh, economic infeasibility as a, as a basis. Uh, just for context, the use of ACMs currently uh, is limited and based on the technological infeasibility of emissions reductions, uh, not on uh, the economic infeasibility. And then finally, the fourth group of comments uh, concern low carbon procurement. Here are some of the comments recommended that any low carbon procurement rules consider the product's full life cycle emissions. And there was also a recommendation that a low carbon procurement strategy should address independent safety and engineering validations impacting construction materials and methods. Uh, next slide, please. So there were three um, areas of unresolved climate justice working group um, feedback that, um, uh, that concerned the industry chapter. The first relates to the chapter strategy of providing financial and technical assistance. The draft scoping plan proposes that the state provide technical and financial assistance to industry to overcome barriers and other challenges to implementing emission reduction, emission reduction solutions necessary for decarbonization. The draft focuses on incentive-based strategies in recognition of the need to avoid leakage and recommends focusing investments in their associated benefits in disadvantaged communities. Um, the Climate Justice Working Group um, stated that directing state assistance toward reducing industrial emissions in disadvantaged communities would be supported and that investments can be prioritized to target industries with the greatest impact on these communities. Additionally, the Climate Justice Working Group noted that the emission reduction strategies for industry do not mention regulation to drive down industrial emissions as close to zero as is technically possible, and that additional regulation of industrial sources must be carefully considered within the Climate Act requirements to limit emissions leakage. The second area of unresolved feedback relates to the strategy of advancing low carbon procurement. Here the draft scoping plan proposes that the state create procurement incentives so that manufacturers will produce less emission intensive goods to capitalize on the increased demand for goods made with fewer emissions. It also states that the specific procurement framework and scoring methodology for any such procurement preferences need to be evaluated against a set of criteria that would effectively and equitably reduce emissions and grow a robust local workforce and manufacturing sector. The Climate Justice Working Group supported this strategy as well as other demand side approaches and recommended using a best value framework to score bids that commit to climate mitigation efforts and related workforce, training, local hire, and apprenticeship programs targeted to residents of disadvantaged communities. The third area of unresolved feedback relates to the strategy of research, development, and demonstration, or RD&D. &D. The draft scoping plan recognizes that long-term deep decarbonization in the industrial sector will require the development of new technologies and that the state could speed the deployment of some of these new solutions with a robust R&D agenda. However, the specific technologies and solutions for deep decarbonization of the industrial sector have yet to be identified. Now on this topic, the Climate Justice Working Group raised concerns 
around technology solutions such as carbon capture and storage and hydrogen, supported reducing fossil fuel combustion for industrial heat, replacing it with electric heat whenever feasible, recognized that some industrial high heat processes may not be electrifiable and that in these cases green hydrogen is a potential alternative fuel, made the point that combusting, combusting hydrogen has the potential to produce potentially harmful levels of nitrous oxide emissions, and stated that identifying, quantifying, and mitigating harmful effects that might be associated with such new technologies and approaches will be a necessary critical concern of future research efforts. Uh, next slide, please. So staff has proposed a number of responses to these comments and unresolved feedback. With regard to both EITEs and the related topic of GHG emission benchmarking, staff recommends that the definition of EIT industries, the establishment of any special accommodations to mitigate leakage, as well as decisions as to benchmarking, be deferred to take place in conjunction with a possible design and development of an economy-wide carbon pricing system. In addition, staff recommends that Appendix C of the draft, draft scoping plan, which discusses EITEs at length and sets out a method by which the state would identify EIT industries, be referenced and highlighted in the industry chapter of the scoping plan. On the topic of alternative compliance mechanisms, staff recommends that the question of whether ACM should be available to avoid leakage where emission reductions are not economically feasible should be considered by DEC in light of its authority to administer ACMs under the environmental conservation law. With the understanding that industrial sources and EITEs in particular should be treated in a manner so as to avoid leakage. On financial and technical assistance, staff recommends that language be added to acknowledge that within the Climate Act requirements to limit leakage, other potential measures must be carefully considered in the event that incentive-based strategies do not achieve sufficient reductions of industrial emissions. With respect to low carbon procurement, staff recommends that language be added to clarify that any low carbon procurement rules should consider the product's full life cycle emissions and that safety and engineering validations be addressed with regard to low carbon construction materials and methods. In addition, consideration should be given to the use of the best value procurement framework to score bids that commit to climate mitigation efforts and related workforce training local hire and apprenticeship programs targeted to residents of disadvantaged communities. And then finally, with regard to our d, &D staff recommends that language be added stating that identifying, quantifying, and mitigating harmful effects, such as nitrous oxide emissions from the combustion of hydrogen, that might be associated with new technologies and approaches to eliminate hard to abate industrial emissions will be a necessary critical concern of future research efforts. And with that, uh, Todd and I are happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. Thanks, Vince. I'm not seeing any questions not here in Albany, <coughs> but I will ask about New York City. Here on New York City. Thanks, Vince, for that great presentation. It's Peter Iwanowitz here in New York City. Um, one of the, while I totally appreciate the sort of staff recommendation to sort of hand the hot potato under the alternative compliance mechanism over to DEC, um, I'm wondering if, if there was a look by staff at the statutory limitations that are in law. I mean, in general, emission standards aren't based on economic issues, they're either based on feasibility or straight up emission standards knowing 50 plus years history of the Federal Clean Air Act and implementation by the state has always driven technology forward rather than trying to meet a, a current standard. So 
I'm just sort of curious as to whether, you know, council has sort of weighed in on this or if it's just sort of a and the hot potato over to DEC. And, and again, I started this, you know, I fully appreciate uh, that sort of approach, but just sort of wondering. Vince, you're on mute. <clears throat> I became muted somehow. Um, I, the rationale, Peter, was that we don't really have any experience um, with alternative compliance mechanisms, and it seemed that DEC, um, in light of their you know, authority to administer them, would be in the best position after some period of time to determine whether there needed to be um, you know, any change, and in particular, um, that change. Um, but um, you know, it wasn't just handing it off to someone else. It was the fact that they would be the ones who presumably would develop some level of knowledge about how the alternative compliance mechanisms were working and if they needed, um, you know, to be, um, uh, the standards need to be revisited, you know, what the best way to do that would be. But we can certainly take that back and discuss it in, in more detail and see if there isn't um, you know, some alternative uh, approach. Okay, uh, just a quick follow up then. It doesn't sound like there was any kind of a deep dive with council on this one. I did review the language, but um, I wouldn't say the recommendation was council driven. It was really as a result of having the folks who will, in some period of time, have some experience with uh, ACMs be the ones who are making that determination. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else in New York City? Thank you. Anyone else in New York City? Okay. We're all set here in Albany and Jeff's all set as well. So thank you, Vince. And uh, we'll move to the next slide and move on uh, to Henry Splitow, uh, the Chief of Prevention and Sustainability Section, uh, the Bureau of Toxic Substance Assessment for the Department of Health. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I will, um, first of all, I want to say that the health chapter is a relatively small chapter in the uh, scoping document. It does not have any strategies or recommendations, but it does include discussion of the many potential health impacts of uh, climate change and also the health benefits that are available through climate policies. Next slide, please. The the comments we received were not as many as some chapters, but we did receive a significant number of comments. And we, the, the health staff team binned the comments into five themes. The first theme was the uh, comment that we should be tracking health outcomes going forward over the coming decades. And in particular, the health outcomes associated with co-pollutant exposure, like respiratory effects and cardiovascular effects. And that we also, a related comment not received quite as often, but was that we should be tracking health outcomes associated with heat, uh, extreme heat events. The next uh, theme of, in the comments that we received pertain to primarily alternative fuels, but also in this theme, we uh, staff in uh, renewable energy and carbon capture comments. And commenters particularly expressed concerns about hydrogen, use of hydrogen, green hydrogen, and also renewable natural gas and potential co-pollutant emissions from these fuels. An additional set of comments related to uh, burning of wood, and these uh, comments were not that many, but some were very detailed, and they described the many uh, well, the particulate emissions associated with wood combustion and concerns about increasing wood burning, particularly recreational wood burning in backyards, not only in rural areas, but in um, upstate cities, uh, the use of fire pits and that sort of thing. And uh, another comment had to do with wind turbines and associated um, noise and health impacts of that. 
And then finally, uh, commenters mentioned carbon capture and potential increases in emissions associated with uh, co pollutants associated with that technology. The next theme of comments uh, that we summarized or that we reviewed related to climate justice and disadvantaged communities. Uh, there were a lot of uh, letters expressing concern about co pollutants in disadvantaged communities and associated with, with specific sources, some of which are named here, uh, high traffic areas, et cetera. And commenters also expressed concerns over the creation of co-pollutant hotspots in the state through policies that might be reducing greenhouse gas emissions statewide, but that might uh, increase uh, emissions of co-pollutants in certain areas, particularly disadvantaged communities. There were also concerns expressed about flooding and housing and building codes and the need to enforce those codes to prevent mortality and other health outcomes uh, associated with flooding in, in the residential sector. There, were, there, were, there, were, there was a fair amount of support expressed, expressed for the need for green space in disadvantaged communities or the lack thereof in some cases and the potential health benefits of um, increasing green space in these communities. And there were calls to increase um, the consideration of indoor air quality in energy efficiency programs uh, addressing buildings and homes in disadvantaged communities. The next theme related to the reliability of the electrical grid and potential public health outcomes or health impacts of uh, power outages and and uh, unreliable grid if, as we move toward full electrification. And, uh, the, uh, and the health outcomes associated with that. So the, 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 I think it's the last theme, the last theme that we uh, identified among the comments was to uh, address additional health effects associated with carbon-based fuels in our chapter. We, well, I'll say what we did in a moment, but uh, the, uh, we, the comments suggest that we need to address additional effects, and they mentioned certain effects like uh, dementia, reproductive effects, et cetera, associated with exposure to co-pollutants, but also uh, that we need to mention a broader range of contaminants and, and pollutants. Uh, there, was, there was a comment made that we should consider, better consider mental health impacts of climate change, and that we omitted the risks of storage and disposal of carbon-based fuels in our chapter. So based on these uh, comments received, staff, the staff group came up with a number of recommendations. Uh, the first relating to the tracking of health outcomes. And again, the health chapter doesn't have strategies and, and it doesn't have recommendations, but the health chapter can expand upon these topics. So related to um, tracking of health outcomes, the health department already tracks all these health outcomes that are associated with, uh, with, with, or that can be associated with climate impacts and co-pollutant exposures, and we will continue to track those outcomes. And we have to make it perhaps more clear in the health chapter that we will continue to track those outcomes. And in fact, we will be expanding the number of health impacts or health outcomes that will be tracked on a, uh, on, a on a higher resolution, a county level. And we can discuss that in the health chapter if the CAC agrees with these recommendations. So uh, <clears throat> related to heat-related illnesses, we also do track heat-related illnesses in New York and uh, New York City. And we publish those regularly. And we, uh, we have also looked at county-level heat-related illnesses and published that. And we will uh, continue to do that. Uh, periodically, and we can mention that in the health chapter. And then, um, let's see, addressing, addressing, oh, I should say, I forgot to mention, there are really two ways of tracking health outcomes. One is to uh, track the actual health outcomes, which reflect multiple different risk factors, including uh, not only exposure to co-pollutants, but also many other risk factors that contribute to disease. And so therefore, those data can't be attributed directly to our policies, but they can reflect to a certain extent if other factors are controlled, the policy impacts. And the other way of uh, tracking health outcomes is to track the, um, 
estimated health benefits of climate policies as we move forward. And the Climate Act actually requires that. And I think we we need the health team recommends that we should mention this in the health chapter that every four years the um, and the, there will be an estimate of the reduction in co pollutants and also the health benefits incurred through the various policies that are put in place. And the the Climate Act also requires that um, health outcomes, estimated health benefits, be tracked in disadvantaged communities associated with various climate spending programs. Regarding the comment that um, we need to be more uh, cognizant of the risks of hydrogen and renewable natural gas. We can add more detail. We do have discussion in the health chapter of those risks, and uh, we can add more detail. And uh, in, ter in terms of incorporating, um, we're, we recommend that we should incorporate the health-based health recommendations of the alternative fuel subgroup and that we emphasize that the Department of Health will continue to monitor literature related to renewable energy sources such as wind turbines and health, and that we will help guide future policies in the siting of that um, type of energy source. Um, next slide, please. So regarding climate justice and disadvantaged communities, we recommend that the importance of ensuring that the policies that are put in place to reduce greenhouse gas emissions also do not result in localized hotspots and um, of, of, of co-pollutants and associated health effects. And that we need to better emphasize the, the benefits of increasing green space in disadvantaged communities. We do discuss that, but we can reinforce that discussion. <clears throat> We also need to better emphasize the importance of enforcement of building codes that prevent flood impacts. We didn't discuss that to some extent in the health chapter, but we can better emphasize that, I think. And we, the recently announced study on extreme heat conditions in disadvantaged communities, I think there's a health connection there at the DC program, but I, I think that's something that we should mention and, and perhaps indicate that the health department can provide support for that as needed. Uh, address regarding the theme about health concerns related to reliability, we do discuss health risks of power outages, but we can provide further detail on that. And regarding the um, additional health effects, we can, we mentioned primarily the health effects with the most causal links to uh, the, the criteria pollutants or the major pollutants associated with energy use. But we can expand that discussion to some extent to discuss some examples of other health effects which have been linked to these, um, pollutants, uh, to these uh, emissions. And uh, let's see where are we here. Storage and disposal. Oh, in terms of, um, what was that? I guess we have to add additional detail on some of the other. Uh, health effects of climate change, mental health, and also mentioned the risk of storage and disposal. They're similar to risks of distribution, which we discussed, but we can expand the discussion to talk about storage and disposal. Next slide. And that's it. <laughs> Any yeah. questions? Please? Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Henry. Uh, appreciate it. Really interesting. Um, Feedback. Anyone in Albany with any questions? I don't see any tent cards up, so I'll ask also about New York City. Yeah, hi, Paul Sheps in here. I just want to comment about the bullets that says emphasize the importance of a reliable grid public health. You know, the CLCPA goes out to 2050, and um, I'll just comment that I'm not sure that I know anyone who needs reliable grid. I think what we need is reliable access to electric power. And that could come from a centralized, you know, grid that, that is managed centrally, or it could come from distributed community power. And uh, I don't want to see the bullet have that language because you don't need necessarily reliable grid. 
We need reliable energy management. Thank you for that, Paul. I, I, I agree. And in fact, the word grid, I, I can't even guarantee that was actually in the comment. It, it, it was sort of a paraphrasing of the comment. But uh, clearly, yes, it's reliable electricity, reliable energy. And, and our discussion will focus on the uh, risks of outages or the risks of the lack of availability of reliable energy. But that's a good point. Thank you. It's not just a grid. Tom? Yeah, I would just add, although I do think the integration analysis calls for 20 gigawatts of offshore wind, 50 gigawatts of storage and solar. But we do rely on a grid. That's kind of what it's showing. And there, certainly I agree we need reliable energy, not a reliable grid, but it's going to be at least that's what our, that's what our analysis shows. Thank you for that. And Peter? Yeah, so my, I just have a comment and knowing that maybe not here in New York, but somewhere the public is sort of, you know, engaged in this today, mostly probably virtually, but um, um, I did want to just sort of commend, you know, the um, Henry and his colleagues at the Department of Health and the folks that put together this chapter and, and just maybe give, share one anecdote of some information that has come out of this from a public health standpoint. If you look at the chapter, the very honest discussion about the negative externalities of combustion of biofuels, um, you know, I thought that was a really great piece of the chapter. And um, when Henry was participating in the Alt Fuels Working Group, um, and here's just a good bit of information that came out of that group that I've been working in this space for 30 years, and I, I knew the significant drawbacks Okay. when you combust ethanol in internal combustion engines uh, as it relates to co pollutants, I didn't know uh, that it actually has a higher cancer risk uh, when you combust ethanol internal combustion engines, even when you factor in the diluting of all the nasty things are in gasoline t today that have known cancer risk, benzene, xylene, toluene. You, you reduce that and you replace it with ethanol, and the cancer risk goes up. So... I think for us as a council and for the public at large to appreciate that it's broader than just moving off of fossil fuels. We really have to take into account combustion of a lot of different things. Um, and just because we grow it naturally doesn't mean it's benign. And I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to really commend Henry and his colleagues at the Department of Health and the other staff that have put this chapter together because I think it does a really strong public service to encapsulate the huge public health benefits of what we're going to be doing. And I know that there are some out there that have come to the hearings. There are some people in the legislature that want to, in Seinfeld parliament, yada, 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 pass the public health benefits. But they're really important. It means fewer people are going to get sick, some of who will die prematurely. Uh, it means all of us will pay less co-pays because we're going to the doctors less often. And some of us will have to reduce our not have to, we'll reduce our, our um, pharmaceutical expenses. So there are real tangible things that people are sitting around their kitchen table now grappling with that they won't have to because we're going to make healthier communities and healthier air quality free. So sorry, I, I wanted to use this opportunity because I think this chapter gets overlooked, but it's extremely significant. And I want to thank Henry again. Well stated. You're here. You're here. That was great. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I'll uh, third or fourth then. It's great to hear that summary from you. Um, I think our last comment will come from Dennis, and then we'll move on to Dennis. Yeah, thanks, Tony. So, and I, it's more of a um, looking at uh, the, la the this presentation on health, and then the last presentation that, that Vince put up. You know, when, and, and it's a statement that I, it bothers me, but I'm not sure how to express it in terms of New York's Climate Act, is that we, we actually place restrictions or, or, let's say, charges on our energy intensive industries in New York to try and use less emission-related energy to produce their product. While at the same time, uh, we're relying on countries like China, Indonesia, and Japan 
who are overbuilding uh, coal fire plants in order to meet the demands of the climate uh, objectives of states like New York. And I just don't know how we, um, how do we reconcile that? And so, okay, our community seems to be okay. <laughs> the hell with the, the other uh, countries that are producing uh, you know, products that we're purchasing, and it's coal fired. Have, I mean, have we, and, and I, maybe it's not the right time. I just, it just, it was concerning when we went through the energy intensive presentation. And because we don't see these slides, I, it takes me a little while to process this. And maybe I read too much. Well, I think that's a bit of the basis for the CHIPS Act and the IRA, right? More domestic production of what we need to become. Uh, to meet our targets, whether it's federal or state. So I would just encourage us to look, look toward those types of things that create security for us on the domestic side and on production also enable us to create jobs here and, and avoid those externalities that we see elsewhere. Uh, but it's a fair point. Yeah, that, no, and I actually yeah. like that point, yeah. but we're not there yet. No. And so we're going to be, um, because we have such a focus on the supply side, uh, by the time we build a, a supply uh, chain here in the U.S., we, we may not need it in New York. That's my concern. It's a timing issue. Right. So, but I appreciate that. Just one follow up. So, I, I think that is an interesting observation. I think we all recognize that climate change is a global phenomenon, but co pollutant production is also global in the sense that um, we are distributing it to other areas as we. Uh, consume products made elsewhere. So, so that, but it's a complicated topic, uh -huh. probably beyond the scope yeah. of what we can address. <laughs> unless, unless we want to all join a global climate action council. <laughs> 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 right? Yeah. Meetings, everyone? <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Henry. That was really, that really well done. Um, so, our last presentation um, is from Adam Ruder, the Assistant Director of Clean Transportation to follow up on some items uh, that resulted from last month's meeting. So we're joined here in Albany by Adam. Sorry about that. One, one final comment from NYC. Uh, okay, please. Thank you. Um, Two. This is uh, Ian Wells from ESD, and just you know, responding to the last comment, and you know, Vince Ravish here is really the expert on this from our team. Um, but in terms of the uh, focus on pollution from the industrial sector, just want to emphasize, I think, two key points. Um, you know, overall, overarching, I think the industrial sector is very cognizant of leakage of both jobs and pollution. Um, so I think that's something that we're focused on. And as part of that, um, the chapter takes a very kind of incentive-based approach to helping uh, the industrial base reduce emissions um, and also looking at procurement preferences, um, which regardless of where the materials are coming from, um, would give a you know, presumably, however, this is designed preference for low emission uh, materials. So I do think that there are some steps that are, are being taken or envisioned in this plan to address that concern. That's it. Thank you. Hi, it's Peter. Just a quick follow up to Dennis's comment about um, other countries and their sort of reliance on coal. Dennis, don't forget from a public health standpoint, the health benefits accrue closest to the stack, closest to the chimney closest to the tailpipe. So when we reduce the emissions here of coal pollutants under our plan, the health benefits are gonna be immediate because they will be realized closest to the source. Well, we'll kill our people in other companies, countries, I don't agree with it. Okay, well, thanks uh, everyone for that feedback. We're gonna move on to Adam um, to follow up on transmit. Sorry, not transmission, transportation related items. Uh, Adam? Thank you, thank you, Doreen. Um, and uh, thank you for having me back. Uh, we, uh, next slide, please. We spoke last month about, uh, about transportation and one topic that we, uh, we wanted to uh, 
hold off on a little bit because we wanted to digest um, the recommendations that were put forward by the alternative fuels work group and make sure that, uh, that we, we fully understood them and, and could be consistent with them uh, was a clean fuel standard. And so the council had asked us how we might be able to design a clean fuel standard uh, that addresses the concerns raised by the climate justice working group uh, that could also be consistent with the recommendations of the alternative fuels working group. Uh, the two main concerns uh, raised by the Climate Justice Worker, Working Group were to make sure that if this were enacted, it would uh, prioritize electrification and uh, address the combustion of renewable fuels uh, and, and their release of harmful air pollutants, as we were just discussing. Um, so this really is uh, an attempt to outline what some program design elements could look like uh, that, that could meet those two concerns. Um, that we would need to advance electrification uh, that's emphasized in the scoping plan already and uh, reducing co-pollutants, especially in disadvantaged communities. Um, you know, this is, uh, those, those were two, I, two of the main recommendations of the alternative fuels group, as well as um, assessing fuels individually, um, not, as a, not as a group. Uh, and you know, a sub-bullet of that is avoiding some particularly problematic fuels, especially uh, things like canola, palm, and uh, carnata feedstocks from foreign countries, and focusing on biodiesel and renewable diesel um, which uh, could reduce particulate matter, uh, while ethanol, uh, that, uh, which um, could increase uh, uh, certain certain pollutants, um, would would also kind of be um, that would be considered as well. So uh, next slide, I wanted to just walk through a few of the considerations. So in terms of what a, what program design could look like for promoting electrification. One key element is to make sure that the credits are easily attainable and uh, for electricity use. Um, sometimes this can be a little bit complicated to track, you know, which uh, electricity use is being used for transportation, but uh, there, there are some approaches that could make them uh, easily, easily uh, in attainable. Um, as far as one of the key elements is to set a long timeline. Uh, for carbon intensity reductions. Uh, a lot of the West Coast uh, initiatives have a relatively short, you know, 10 year timeline, time horizon for when the, um, when they're gonna achieve their carbon intensity reductions. But we think that by setting a timeline of what this is gonna look like out to 2050, this will send an easily understood price signal to the market and clarify that the long-term trajectory uh, has to be designed to meet the Climate Act targets. Um, this may reduce the market signal for biofuels investments um, that would cease generating cre credits as the target carbon intensity uh, decreases. We also think it would be important to uh, reinvest the credit value from electrification into supporting further electrification, uh, particularly targeted toward low and moderate income New Yorkers and disadvantaged communities. There are a few different ways that this could work. One could be that, uh, similar to how they do this in the Western states that have, uh, have these programs, you could allow utilities to aggregate credits from home charging uh, and generate revenue from those sales of credits, which the Public Service Commission and, and DPS staff could then regulate the spending of those uh, revenues generated by those credits um, consistent with the target. The other option would be uh, that uh, we could have the state of New York, uh, possibly through NYSERDA, aggregate the credits for home charging directly and sell those credits through auctions. Um, and then the proceeds could be spent uh, in con uh, consistently with this target. Next slide, please. Addressing some of the other um, disadvantaged community benefits and uh, that could come from a program design around the clean fuel standard, 
One is addressing criteria pollutants. And so for this element, one option could be uh, to implement a screen that would limit the eligibility of fuels uh, that don't, that have lower overall, uh, yeah, sorry, to only fuels with lower overall co-pollutant emissions than petroleum um, that, that would be being displaced. Uh, now this may vary by application, you know, a gallon of diesel fuel used in one engine is not necessarily the same as a gallon of diesel fuel used in a different engine. Um, but uh, there, there could be a process designed for that. So ultimately, fuels that would not meet that test would not generate credits regardless of their greenhouse gas emission uh, pollution. And then um, the other, there could be other opportunities to benefit disadvantaged communities. Um, such as allowing transit agencies uh, to earn credit value for their provision of electrified transit and reinvesting that credit value in new or expanded electrified transit, especially in disadvantaged communities. Um, allowing public entities, nonprofits, and potentially other um, to be issued advanced credits, uh, advanced credits uh, to help them make that upfront purchase of uh, of electric and zero emission technologies. Um, so that could make the, rather than just being a focus on the operating costs where, you know, which is what tends to happen because this is about, you know, fuel purchases, you could try to bring that up front to help accelerate the, um, the purchase of the vehicles that are going to use these fuels. And, uh, and reduce this other barrier of, of high upfront costs of the vehicles. And then uh, this is a great way to do that without uh, the requirement of having additional state revenue for that. And then the other option would be to uh, use the credit value from electrification to provide, to provide to direct rebates to LMI households. Um, that could be in the form of cash or credit on a utility bill or uh, could help fund uh, things like free transit passes um, or uh, additional rebates for, for the purchase or lease of new or used electric vehicles. So, you know, the purpose of this presentation is not to say that this is a recommendation, but really to try to lay out what some of the options could be uh, to try to address the concerns that have been raised around a clean fuel standard. Um, and, and, you know, show that there are, we think, uh, some ways to address them uh, constructively. And, uh, and, and there's not just one option, but, but I think a number of different ways to address this. Thank you. That's it? That's it? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't sure. Um, so with that framing, is being sought, you know, sort of you're seeking feedback, right? Uh, yes. This is where yes, so we would love feedback, um, and, uh, you know, we, yeah, we would love feedback. <laughs> You're about to get feedback. <laughs> so I want to make sure I understand the, 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 this is Rory, for those on the phone, uh, how one would accumulate credit. It would be for any additional electric use above the current baseline that's used towards transportation. Is that, am I, is that how I should interpret it? Uh, for specifically for electric, uh, for right. electric <laughs> transportation use. Right. Um, I don't necessarily think it has to be above uh, the baseline because EVs that are on the road now would generate credits yeah. as well. Okay. So the <laughs> New York City transit system, let's say, throughout all of New York City, would that automatically count? It could, that, that's one element of the program design that we could we could include. I know that uh, in California, transit operators and, uh, and I believe electrified rail does generate credits. Uh, I am not an economist. I work with them a lot. Um, I just have a concern with that in that it may create a, uh, a large single entity with a lot of credits who can throw their weight around to the detriment of others. It was just one potential concern um, with that. Um, second, are all credits throughout the state created equal? Would a credit in Buffalo be equivalent to a credit in Lower Manhattan, for example? Same car, all other things being equal. Um, 
That's a, again, that's a great question. You know, I think it uh, generally, you know, to have a market, um, the credits need to be fungible uh, across across the state. But you know, does an EV in Buffalo generate you know, 1.2 times as much as in New York City, or vice versa? Um, I don't know that we've contemplated anything like that, but you know, again, we can you know the the program could be designed however we however we choose. Okay. My final comment, um, you know, there have been a number of studies I've read recently that talk about the effectiveness of EV placement. Should you be going for maximum number of EVs irrespective of miles traveled? Or so, for example, in a city where someone may drive 10 miles a day and that's it. Or do you want to go rural, where someone could drive easily 100, if not 200 miles a day and electrify that vehicle? That single one to 200 mile a day vehicle will probably create far more credits than any number of vehicles in an urban setting. Um, so just thinking about the construct, you know, which, where would the emphasis need to be to make this program most effective? Would it be for number of vehicles or miles traveled? So the, the program, I mean, at the end of the day, the program is uh, looking at the fuel used, the, you know, the, the quantity of fuel used. And um, you know, fuel, the, the more fuel that is used that is below the carbon intensity target, you know, the more, the more car credits are, getting, are being generated. Um, for this particular program, a you know a car that's driving more miles and and displacing more fuel would certainly generate more credits, um, and uh, you know that yeah that's how this would work. But there are certainly other you know other programs that would address things in different ways. Thank you. That was very helpful. And I think Dennis is before me. I put it down because I thought or oh. I was going to ask the same question. Well, I, I, I do. No. I, I, the key, to me, it's a priority issue. Is the electric vehicle the priority in these type of communities? When I think about the communities that I operate in, I look at all of the activity that goes on. A lot of those are municipal vehicles. Uh, they're postal vehicles. And so, you know, I, I don't know if, if this is how you've looked at this. Or are they in a separate category because they're considered medium to heavy use? But if but if we focus on mass transit, focus on garbage vehicles, garbage trucks, postal vehicles, uh, municipal service vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, as a priority out of the gate, wouldn't we think we'd make a more dramatic impact versus how many electric vehicles can I put out there? You know, I, I think that could come, um, but is that priority? So uh, this is not specific to light duty vehicles. You know, this this isn't necessarily specific to light it, duty. I'm I'm more referring in an LMI community. I try to see what all the the transportation activity is, and it's honestly not a, a car. They're either coming in or leaving. You know, whereas service vehicles, garbage vehicles, they spend a lot of time. Idling so, in those communities. So you're referring to what the what the best way, if we were to reinvest funds in an LMI or a com, uh, community or a DAC, what the best way to get uh, the the reductions in that community would be? That's correct. That's yeah. the priority. And yeah, then, I, and I then, think we're and then, we're so, agnostic to exactly what that money would go to. And I want those vehicles built in that community. Uh, just because I think that's the real value here. So I just think uh, I'm trying to understand priorities. And, uh, you know, I don't see an electric vehicle as a priority um, right. in those type of settings. The program not, not in and of itself, itself. I'm just trying to understand activity. Right. The program in and of itself can be designed to focus on, you know, it to, to, could be designed to require that the benefits are, are reinvested in. However, you know, however we decide to do that, it doesn't have to just be to passenger vehicles okay. or okay, good. That makes sense. Okay. That makes it feel awesome. Thank you. So thank you for doing this. I think I was one of the people that asked this question. 
um, and it's really helpful. I think it's a, you know, it shows that it can be designed a lot of different ways. And I think I get all of them, but I'm sure but not, not quite all of them. If you could say one more word of how the advanced credits would work. I, I'm just assuming that there would have to be some entity kind of fronting the money, knowing that if an agency invested in alternative fuel vehicles, they would have credits to sell. But someone would have to give them that money. That's one question. And a little bit more about how it might work for a transit agency. So I'm a transit agency. I'm using electric buses around Albany and how that process might, might work, depending on how it's designed. Sure. Uh, so um, with the transit agencies first, you know, the, the way at least it works in on the West Coast generally is that um, for fleets like a like a transit fleet, um, they're allowed to generate to to take the credits that their electricity use for transportation is are, is generating. <clears throat> so rather than it going to a utility or a charging station provider, they're allowed to claim those credits and then sell the credits to a petroleum uh, produce, uh, petroleum vendor. Um, to to get revenue to then reinvest uh, okay. in their in their operations. Um, as far as the advanced credits, um, you know, I don't know if Vlad is on and wants to ex explain a little bit more of that. I, I can I can give it a shot, but um, I think yeah. Vlad would probably do a better job than I. Can. <laughs> so for eligible entities, uh, transit, you know, there are some uh, categories listed there, uh, public agencies like transit agencies, nonprofits, and things like that. They would come to the state and say, you know, our, we have a plan to purchase X number of vehicles, uh, electric vehicles. You know, so let's say it's 10 electric buses. We, in, we project that these buses would run, would uh, drive this many miles per year. We would use them for this many years. This is how much electricity we would we would anticipate that they would uh, end up consuming in service as part of their service route. So the state would uh, sort of evaluate evaluate that uh, that application and issue to the eight, to this entity advanced credits equal to some seventy percent of what of what they might expect to earn uh, be issued uh, running that vehicle over the first say ten years or some other or some other time period. So then the agency then, the, the, this entity now has these advanced credits, which have a value on the market and is able to sell them. And so they sell them and, and receive proceeds that they are then able to use to defray the upfront cost of purchasing the bus, purchasing the uh, charging, any other kind of upgrades that are necessary associated with that. Uh, in these situations, this would be potentially a good place to say, you know, require that, you know, uh, associated infrastructure improvements and things like that must be done uh, consistent with, uh, you know, certain high labor standards and a variety of other kind of requirements consistent with the CLCPA and things like that. As the bus in this example then drives and consumes electricity consistent with what the original application provided, the entity is issued actual credits, which it pays back to the state. So the state fronts credits, uh, you know, uh, before the vehicle is purchased, to help pay for the vehicle in the first place, and then and then is paid back as the vehicle actually operates on the road over the course of the subsequent years. And so the result is that you know this this electric bus with its charger may have cost a few hundred thousand dollars extra, but that additional incremental cost and potentially more depending on the value of credits on the in the market. Is, uh, is is sort of fronted to the agency, enabling them to make the purchase without additional costs, and then the state is made whole over the subsequent, you know, uh, over the subsequent uh, uh, years of, of the vehicle's use. Does that answer the yep. question, Anne? Totally. Yeah, thank you, um, Vlad. I, I wanted to see if folks have questions in New York City before we double back to our Albany office. Yeah, hi, Dorian, thanks. Um, and this might be for you again, Vlad. Um, I have two questions that kind of looks at the issue of, from two different perspectives, but just wondering, you know, how we take into account existing requirements. So first, school districts, they're gonna be required to buy electric vehicles for zero emissions under the statute. Um, 
How do you sort of, you know, square up the fact that they have this obligation already and now you're looking at potentially giving them incentive? And then the flip side on the fuel itself. So if an electricity provider is given credits for a low carbon version of electricity, and I'm not sure if this is the scheme or not, but they also get REC credits from the state uh, that consumers are already paying for. How do we ensure, I don't know, I'm not sure if double dipping is the sort of right you know, way to phrase it, but it's being paid for, it's being required. You know, school districts required, we're paying for it on our electricity bills right now. And ultimately, this is all designed so that the oil companies have to be buying these credits, right? And so, all, you know, to be frank, you know, this is kind of also leading into a, a gas tax. So consumers are gonna be sort of paying it already with their utility bills. And if a power company wants to, you know, require the, the, the oil companies to pay more for the carbon intensity, kind of, how does it all sort of work out in the wash? I guess is my broader question and giving you a couple examples. Yeah, so, so the trajectory the trajectory that we set would be would need to be tied to achieving CLCPA targets, right? And the CLCPA targets include all the commitment on, you know, electric school buses. They will they certainly incorporate, you know, for example, you know, uh, the 2035 requirement for uh, all new vehicles to be zero emission and things like that. So we, we would need to set up the trajectory and set today's, you know, or not today's, but the initial year's target to reflect the state of transportation in New York State, right? When California started this in 2011, there were very, very little vehicles that were using anything but, but oil, right? If we start saying, I don't know, 2024 as the as CLCPA directs, you know, years have gone by, and so there's a different mix of transportation fuels, and so we would want to set our initial baseline and the trajectory to reflect the fact that there have been a number of commitments made by state and other entities, and a num you know a, a wide variety of electric vehicles and other alternative fuels already deployed, and you know, to, to, to enable that deployment. Yes, I think what would happen here is that certain entities would end up receiving some value for complying with their requirements, but we would be sort of reducing the cost to them of purchasing, say, the school buses or whatever. And maybe for those entities that are public entities would reduce the amount of money that needs to come from tax purposes, tax revenue or other state sources to fund that transition. Uh, stretching state dollars to other purposes or for, for, for greater effect within the same, within the same bucket of spending. With, with the electricity question, so, so there's, we sort of have a variety of options. The New York has a variety of options here. So in California, for example, um, the, as I recall, they have an average grid mix that is uh, uh, associated with their electricity unless the utility purchases, you know, RECs to make a claim that that, that power was, not just the utility, I should say the charging provider, whoever it may be. Uh, to make the claim that that power was was zero emission, Washington uh, has each individual have each individual utility receive its own uh, GHG score associated with the where it gets its electricity. That may not be as feasible in New York because our electricity market is structured. But the point is that there's sort of a variety of ways to get at that. Um, Oregon, I believe, allows so in in those places where you can purchase a rec with with. The utilities and participants the market have found is that that purchase of the renewable attribute, the increased deployment of renewables actually creates more value in terms of the clean fuels credit than it costs to purchase the REC. So the result is that the clean fuels program is essentially creating this additional value for renewable attributes on the electricity side as well because the because of the value created associated with the market. And and to your point about you know the oil oil industry purchasing credit is being required as the obligated party. Yeah, I think I think part of the 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 case for the clean fuel standard is that it's a cross subsidy, right? It's a cross subsidy from high emission sources to low emission sources. Rather than being and I don't mean this is a bad thing, rather than being a taxpayer subsidy, it's a cross subsidy between industries. And so over and so that that that's what it's essentially doing. It's it's shifting funds from high emitting sources to low emitting sources in order to make those low emitting sources more cost competitive for the consumer, for the purchaser of fuel, for the purchaser of the equipment, what, what have you. Does that answer all those things? Glad I am um, appreciative of, of all that detail. Um, wow. Um, any other final question um, 
from New York City. I, just looking at the I, mean, I just have a broad one. Um, uh, you were asked for sort of input. This is a lot of new stuff to kind of digest for yeah. the first time at the council. I don't know what's the process for providing input and sort of sitting with this stew a little bit. Yeah, your question is actually the same as mine. Um, Adam, what is the process you would like to follow <laughs> for providing input, um, given that, you know, this is formative, right? Yeah, um, you know, we are, I, I don't think that we need to get into a, a, you know, an extreme level of detail in the scoping plan if we did want to put something like this forward. Um, but we could certainly come back at uh, the next meeting and and uh, and ask for feedback and and you know uh, have a little more um, discussion about um, whether this is something that we want to include in the scoping plan or not. Uh, Jared, if you had any other thoughts on yeah, that, I mean, I guess the schedule is you know, sharing red line chapter revision short. And and so what what we could do is is you know put some draft language in the transportation chapter that then get feedback from the council on that specifically. Yeah, I think you know what we would what we I at least what I'm taking from this discussion is this design is capable of of being quite <laughs> flexible as the sort of the mechanisms both that are used that, or that could be used sort of not only spur behavior but incur benefits um, accordingly. Um, so with that, I'm just wanting to wrap up, but the chair has his card up, so I always uh, have to end uh, with, with uh, any final thoughts you have. I, I will be very quick. I, I, um, I like the idea, I like the direction that you outlined, and I, I think the key thing to keep in mind as you develop the program is one of the things you said earlier about using it as kind of a um, self-funding mechanism mm -hmm. for accelerating electrification. And I think the, the devil's going to be in the details, but I think one of the key things, and this goes back to my earlier question about this Buffalo Mile work more than a Manhattan Mile, you know, um, not all vehicle mile travels are the same, right? Um, all of us on a bus, an electric bus, displaces many gallons of gasoline, and that credit created from that mile traveled with the collective group on that bus should probably be worth a lot more than that single person driving, wherever they may be. And if there's a way to capture that and quantify that and monetize that, I think that can then drive the right kind of development in a direction towards acceleration away from gasoline-powered vehicles towards electric vehicles, whether that be through mass transit or individual vehicles, whatever it may be. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Vlad. And uh, finally, I'll ask Maureen to close us out with our next steps as a reminder of where we are and where we're heading. Thanks, so all. This is just a duplication of the slide that was shared by Sarah at the last meeting that lays out the remaining CAC meetings through the end of the year. The next one on the 25th of October, wrapping up any outstanding topics for the public feedback, including climate justice, as was described at the last meeting. And then, as Jared alluded to, there'll be a process of the members receiving uh, draft red line revisions to chapters and a process of reviewing those in uh, cyclical fashion to get us to um, the final with any discussion on those red lines of the month of November being brought forth in December. And hopefully the great discussions we've had with the subgroup and the public feedback minimizes the number of open issues that we need to address in the month of December. And with that, Great, Any thoughts? Well, listen, thank you. Uh, we'll see you what day? 25th. 25th. <laughs> see you all the 25th. Thank you all. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you.